Hey, here's uh, Gregor. Is there a technical person available? So we're we're just setting up now. We should have people online in a few minutes. Yeah, I just uh, had a very simple question. I'm looking over the technical installation from the source, and there are a lot of dependencies on there that I don't want to execute on my system. So you definitely don't want to install from source if you can possibly avoid it. Uh, that's exactly my point. Um, so if I if I if I follow this install, it will be what kind of with my other Python. What uh, kind of computer are you? You have a Linux installation. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a twenty one or four Ubuntu then, system. Then, then please use the Na the Nano Hub for the course, and we will help you after the course with the Linux. Okay. Because uh, because I we're I apologize. I don't want to discourage you, but at the moment, I have to set up the. I have to set up the. Uh, I, I I totally understand. The class. I just, yeah, uh, it's but, part of my evaluation uh, process. You know what needs to be done, and you know where, right. where things can go wrong. Do you guys guys have a, a Docker container in any form? No, no, uh, we don't. Uh, we'd like to. So let's let's talk about that, but not okay. right now. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So it was just uh, just for me to get get in parallel started, but I have to drop out because I have many different meetings. Right. I understand, and I, I just thank you for joining us. It's just that uh, yeah. uh, right at the moment, I've got to get the the logistics of the meeting taken care of. Uh, thank you okay. so much. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Bye.
Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming to the 15th annual CompuCell training workshop. Every year is a little different. Uh, this year, clearly, we are doing it virtually. We appreciate your coming and uh, spending some time with us. These early 10 o'clock meetings are informal. Uh, the goal here is to uh, provide you a brief outline of what we're going to cover during the day and have an opportunity for questions and discussions uh, before the meeting proper starts at uh, 10.30. So it's a time to make sure everybody can log in, get things set up, and uh, troubleshoot before we start with the formal program for the day. I need to remind you that all of the meeting will be live streamed and recorded. So please keep that in mind. Uh, please keep yourself muted unless you're speaking and during the main presentations. So during the main presentations, if you're going to need help, please use the Slack channel or the uh, chat. And we have set up a series of breakout rooms where you can go for one-on-one -on -one help uh, if you need it. And we have a variety of people here to help with that. Uh, we'll also be using polls to make sure that uh, people are able to stay on the same page. Today is going to be mostly introduction. We'll begin uh, with uh, by showing you very, very quickly a few things about CompuCell and some of the things that you could do. Uh, then uh, Giuliano, uh, is going to do an initial uh, set of exercises with you uh, to teach you about some of the features of CompuCell. And then uh, Giulio Belmonte will take over and talk about how the intrinsic methodology of CompuCell works and then begin to explore using it to model uh, cells. So that's the agenda for today. Tomorrow, we will continue with that start introducing chemical fields. And then Wednesday, we will begin to apply those in more detail, begin to understand how to include subcellular signaling or regulation. And uh, Thursday, that will be mostly an extension, focusing on how you control cells uh, using signaling and uh, regulatory networks. And then Friday, we're going to talk about some advanced concepts of compartmental cell modeling and solids and link modeling as well. Uh, next week, Saturday and Sunday, uh, we have the hackathon. If you haven't signed up, you can still sign up. There's no obligation. We strongly encourage people to participate if they have interest. Uh, you don't have to have your own project. You're welcome to uh, piggyback on others. In fact, we encourage teaming. So again, today we have this half an hour to uh, talk a little bit if we need to, do troubleshooting. Then at 10.30 to noon, I will present my introduction to CompuCell, and then we'll have a short break. Uh, we'll have Giuliano's talk uh, from 12.15 to 1.45, a half an hour for lunch. Of course, it may not be lunch, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, then we will begin with uh, Giulio's uh, explanation of how CompuCell works and work on uh, how cell shapes can be controlled. After that, we'll have a half an hour optionally uh, for discussion and troubleshooting at the end of the day. And that will be the rhythm for the week, uh, give or take minor exceptions. Again, with Zoom logistics, I hope everybody is okay with the Zoom. Uh, occasionally things happen. Uh, if my internet drops out, somebody else's internet drops out, the slide decks are available uh, in the student materials folder. And if there's a temporary interruption, when I'll come back, uh, whoever's speaking will come back. If it looks like it's going to be an extended interruption, uh, one of the other instructors will pick up and continue the lectures. We will provide all of the videos recorded. Uh, they're on YouTube, as I say. We'll also try to have edited versions of them available in the student materials folder. Um, we'll use this, uh, are you done with the exercise poll quite a bit? I'll just show you what that looks like. 
it looks like this. So if you say, how are you doing? You could say, yes. Uh, you could say, not doing the exercise. You could say, need more time or need help. If you need help, please let us know who you are so that uh, we can uh, help put you into a breakout room. So use the chat to ask that question. Uh, one problem with this polling method is that you can only answer the question once. And so uh, if you are making good progress on the exercise, don't answer uh, uh, until it looks like the, the uh, speaker is going to move on. Uh, the other thing we'll do sometimes is we'll do the polls more than once. So we'll throw the poll up. Uh, if there are a lot of people who are saying need more time, We'll wait a minute or two and then throw the poll up again. So if you see the poll more than once, uh, please don't be nervous about that. It's our way of making sure that everybody's able to stay together without uh, endless delays. So I hope that makes sense for people. There are going to be some other polls in particular. At the end of each module, there is going to be a questionnaire about the presentations in the module. Uh, we take these quite seriously, so please uh, do use them uh, and let us know what we could do better. Uh, if it was too slow, too fast, unclear, uh, we take that very seriously. And year to year, we do make improvements uh, to these uh, modules. So uh, please do answer those questions at the end of each module. And if it looks like the speaker is going to forget to post the module questionnaire at the end of the module, somebody feel free to break it and remind them that they need to do that, okay? So I think those are the main logistics. Uh, we have a pretty big group. Uh, we have 66 people who have logged in so far. Uh, we have uh, more people who've said they're going to participate who may not join us till 10.30 to the official time of the start. Uh, we'll do our best to give people one-on-one -on -one attention, uh, but if you feel that you're being neglected for some reason, please uh, let us know. Somebody asked the question in the chat. Um, if we haven't signed up, where do we formally sign up for the hackathon? Uh, please send me an email. I'll put my email address in the chat. You don't really have to sign up, but we definitely want to know that you're planning on participating. Uh, and I'll do a little poll about which people are likely to attend the hackathon in the, the main session. Since this was an optional session, I don't want to have anything here uh, that would prejudice uh, people who joined at 1030. Uh, but again, the hackathon is a lot of fun. Uh, we hope you'll participate. It's not required. Uh, but uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, so that's a good follow-on for that, the hackathon details. Uh, that'll be Saturday and Sunday this year. It's a two-day uh, hackathon. Uh, we are going to do our best to help people team up, but you really need to self-organize. The Slack channel has a hackathon uh, channel in it. Uh, in addition, uh, we've created a uh, folder where you can upload a single PowerPoint if you have an idea for a project. If you put those PowerPoints there today or even tomorrow morning by early morning, I will put them together in a slide deck. And the reason I'm doing it that way is it's just too complicated to go back and forth uh, between 60 possible speakers. So what I'll do is I'll create a slide deck of all the slides I have. Uh, we'll walk through them. People can present for a minute or two about their idea. And then uh, we can have a general discussion that Jim Sluka will lead uh, about some other possibilities for people who want to participate uh, but don't have an idea yet. Uh, and then we'll meet again on Thursday on the same topic. So if you... If you have an idea that comes to you as you're working through the course between Tuesday and Thursday, don't feel you're frozen out. Uh, and for that matter, if you come up with an idea between Thursday and Saturday and you want to recruit people to work on a project together, that's fine too. Um, so again, uh, the hackathon can be a lot of fun. Over the years, we've had people take those ideas and turn, uh, turn 
those projects into uh, into uh, publishable work. Somebody asks who I am again. My name is James Glazier. I'm a professor of intelligent systems engineering here at Indiana University. And uh, I'm not going to be speaking that much, uh, but I'll be in the background a lot. I'll be giving the introductory lecture today in a few minutes. Uh, and then I'll be doing uh, the hackathon organization and also uh, the uh, introductory lecture on subcellular network modeling. Okay, I remind people that uh, if you want to download uh, your uh, CompuCell to your desktop, uh, you can go to the CompuCell website and do that. Uh, we encourage people, especially if you're running Linux, uh, not to do that, uh, at least not now. If you have desktop CompuCell running, it's fine. Uh, but I strongly recommend that you don't spend a lot of time uh, doing that at the moment. Um, we will be teaching CompuCell mostly through the NanoHub application. Uh, that NanoHub application has some advantages and some disadvantages, as we'll see very soon. Uh, but it does have one great advantage, which is you don't need to load anything onto your computer. It's purely web interface. Uh, and so again, uh, I strongly encourage you uh, to uh, look and uh, register if you haven't registered already. Uh, so that you'll have access to this uh, CompuCell tool on NanoHub, and we'll do our best uh, to teach around that. Uh, again, if you can do all the exercises and everything else with the desktop version, uh, but uh, it will look slightly different. Uh, and so, uh, and some of the issues about how you load and unload files will be slightly different as well. Uh, if you do want to download uh, CompuCell, uh, there are installers available for Windows and Mac. Uh, if you go to the CompuCell website, you'll find those. Uh, depending on your particular computer, you may have to override uh, some security settings to install CompuCell. Uh, so that uh, may take a little bit of effort, depending on how your computer is configured. Uh, if you have a Linux computer, depending on the particular species of Linux you have, that installation can be complicated and uh, we'll do our best, but with this many students this year, it may be difficult for us to support people who have a custom Linux installation during the next week. So if you're using Linux and it doesn't install first thing, I really recommend uh, doing, uh, doing a, uh, using the NanoHub version. We have a lot of resources. They're a little bit scattered. Uh, there's the main CompuCell website, uh, which has online manuals. Those are good resources. Uh, we will be using uh, for subcellular modeling uh, the Tellurium antimony language. Uh, that's an extremely simple way to specify network models. Uh, some people may have taken Herbert Sauro's class a little over a week ago uh, on using antimony and Tellurium. Uh, there are videos available online for that class if you want to bone up on that. Uh, Herbert's manuals uh, for Tellurium, especially the first page of the manuals teach you almost everything you need to build the language. It's exceedingly simple. Uh, so you might want to look at that. Uh, we have a variety of quick reference guides. They're very useful. They're, we encourage you to print out the quick reference guides. Uh, there's a simple Python cheat sheet there's a quick guide to CompuCell and a quick guide to Tellurium antimony. Uh, those are all very nice to have on your sheet on the desk so that you don't have to keep flipping back and forth between windows. Uh, the Slack channel you should have. Uh, there is a uh, student materials directory in Google Drive. Uh, we'll try to make sure that the slides for all of the lectures are up there uh, and any other relevant materials. And it may take us a little bit longer, but we'll also post those materials to the CompuCell 3D website. Again, the Slack, there should be some channels. So far, people have signed up for the Slack, but not used it very much. Uh, I'm not a big Slack person myself. Uh, you can always use the chat for the Zoom. 
And now an introduction to the people. Uh, again, I'm James Glazier from the University. Uh, yesterday's Python introduction was led by TJ Sego, also here at IU. We're going to have help and lectures from uh, Gilberto Tomas, who's joining us from Brazil. Um, we have uh, Giulio Belmonte, who's going to be lecturing today, who's joining us from North Carolina State University. Giuliano uh, Ferrari Gianluppi will be helping out and giving us some lectures today. Uh, Jim Sluka, also IU, will be lecturing later in the week and helping out. Uh, Joshua Ponte Serrano will also be lecturing and helping out. And we hope that uh, Bobby Maramanchi from University of Michigan who's an expert in science education, uh, will be joining us at least for some of the meetings. And we also have very generous uh, volunteers. Uh, Lorenzo Vescini from King's College London is going to help us uh, with some of these things. He'll also be participating in the hackathon. And uh, Pedro del Castel uh, from Brazil is also going to be available. And we also have Mateus uh, Swat, uh, who's helping out uh, with the web administration and the Zoom. So that's our list of people. And with that, I think I would like to turn it over. Are there any questions uh, that you want to have answered? Uh, I see a question in the NanoHub website. I don't see Binghamton University in the drop-down menu. Um, you should be able to sign up for NanoHub uh, from anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, you don't need to have a university credential to do it. Uh, you have options of signing in uh, with your Google account, for example, uh, and there are another number of other options as well. Uh, if you have trouble with that, we can put you in a breakout room and uh, have, that, uh, have them help you with that. Are there any other questions at the moment that we need to address before we get started? And since this is a question session, feel free to unmute if you'd rather and, and, and ask verbally as well. I'm going to run, the, I'll run the, the poll again uh, later during the main meeting. But if it's okay with you, why don't we just get a quick, um, a quick question on uh, the hackathon. If you want to tell me uh, just, and I'll ask, I'll launch this again in a minute, but I want to get a rough sense of how many people think they might like to participate in the hackathon. I certainly understand that after a week of course, if it's too much, uh, that's fine. You'll have other opportunities. Um, but I, I hope uh, that uh, people will participate and that it's enjoyable. Okay, that gives me a pretty good a pretty good estimate of uh, what people are thinking. If you say you're unsure, you can decide at the last minute. There's no, no reason that you can't wait and see how the course goes and then decide whether you want to spend two more days working on it. That's fine. If you are sure, please suggest, uh, and you have a topic idea, then please should probably have asked the question, do you have a topic idea already? Um, that really was what the question about teaming was for. Okay. Okay, any other questions before we, before we get started? Please share the Google folder link for the workshop. 
Um, TJ, can you paste that in for me? I can do it as well if you, if you don't have it. So the overall link for all the student materials is here. And the student materials have some subdirectories to them as well. Okay. Any other questions while we're while we're getting organized. What is IUPUI? IUPUI is Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. So if you're in located in the Indiana campus of Indiana University, that would be your selection. TJ points out that that's where he went to school. It's where our medical school is, among other things. It's the second biggest campus in the Indiana University system with 30,000 students. And it's located immediately next to the State House uh, in downtown Indianapolis. And it has a very strange name because it has an interesting uh, administrative structure. It's part of both Purdue University and Indiana University. So some departments are Purdue University departments and some departments are Indiana University departments. Again, you don't have to you don't have to log in to NanoHub through uh, through um, through a uh, through uh, a university. You can sign in using any of the other methods that you like. Okay, why don't we take a five minute break, uh, and then we will come back in. Uh, in five minutes and we will start the official lectures. How's that?
Okay, welcome everybody. We'll give people one or two more minutes to uh, sign in. If anybody has any problems, please let us know. Uh, we have breakout rooms available to help out. Uh, there'll be a little bit of repetition during this uh, session for people who didn't uh, join the uh, optional introduction a few minutes ago. So let me give us just one minute more for people to sign in. And then we'll get started. Okay, welcome everyone to the 15th annual CompuCell modeling workshop. I'm going to start out with a brief review of CompuCell and some of the things that it can do. Uh, we post all of the links in the chat as we go along. I need to remind you that the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and it's being recorded. Uh, so please keep that in mind as we go forward. I'm going to quickly go over the course logistics. Some of you have just heard that, but for people who are just joining us, I'll do that. I'll remind you about the hackathon and uh, on resources, and then we'll start actually talking about CompuCell and modeling more generally. Logistics. Um, you have the Zoom links here. Uh, the same Zoom link uh, that you use today should work throughout the week. There'll be a separate Zoom link for the hackathon. Uh, please do make sure that you can register for those. Uh, we can repost the hackathon link uh, in a second on the chat. Uh, if you're going to do the hackathon, we ask you to put your idea into the hackathon document, which is shared in Google Drive. Uh, the Slack also has a hackathon channel, and there's a folder where people with ideas should upload a slide uh, where they can come and uh, present them tomorrow. Zoom logistics, please keep yourself muted during the presentations and ask questions uh, through the chat uh, or through the Slack channels. Feel free to use the go slower, go faster buttons. Uh, feel free to use the raise hand button. Um, all of the exercises and uh, slides and videos will be made available afterwards if you miss something. Uh, we don't want to leave people behind. Uh, but sometimes things happen and you have to miss a session. And so we'll do our best to support people who can't be here the whole time. Again, uh, you've heard me before. I'm James Glazier, Indiana University. We have TJ Sigo, Gilberto Tomas, Giulio Belmonte, Giuliano Ferrari Gianlupi, Jim Sluca, and Josh Ponte Serrano, all of whom are going to be giving presentations. Uh, Bobby Maramanchi made be helping out. And we have uh, volunteer help from uh, Professor Lorenzo Veschini, King's College London, and Pedro Castell from Brazil. We're very grateful to them for their help. The daily schedule will be, for those of you who were here earlier, um, an informal uh, orientation to the day's agenda and question session from about 10 a.m. to 10.30. Uh, we'll start formally at 10.30 a.m. till noon short break, uh, then uh, the second session of the day, a slightly longer break, which we call a lunch break, but what time zone you're in will depend, uh, make that maybe something different like a dinner break or a breakfast break. And then we'll have two more modules followed by an opportunity for more discussion and troubleshooting at the end of the day. Uh, the tentative course outline today, we're going to be introducing CompuCell uh, and the basics. Uh, I'll be lecturing for the first hour and a half, then Giuliano, 
uh, Julio will take over in the late afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, Juliana will start again. Then we have those hackathon lightning talks and possible discussion about teaming. Uh, TJ will show some of his COVID modeling work and then we'll introduce chemical fields. Wednesday will be focused on the interactions between cells and chemical fields and begin to discuss modeling subcellular networks. Uh, Thursday will mainly be devoted to modeling subcellular networks and their control of cells. And Friday we'll be discussing more advanced topics like links, solids, and compartmental cells. And then next Saturday and Sunday will be the hackathon. Again, I'm going to put the hackathon uh, poll up uh, one more time. Uh, we have uh, we have. Uh, I know some people have answered this already. If you're just trying to get a rough sense of how many people want to participate. And it's fine if you change your mind as you see how things go. You don't have to have an idea to participate, um, but we definitely encourage you. In the past, it's been a lot of fun and people have come up with some projects that have led to PhD theses, publications and so on. If you do have an idea, please reach out to us. Uh, if you want help with an idea, please also reach out to us and we'll be happy to work with you. Does anybody else want to state an opinion before I close the poll? Yeah, I press submit and it doesn't work twice. So, but I intend to be there observing Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Well, I apologize if, is anybody else having trouble using the poll? Okay. Okay, but it looks like we have, it looks like we have plenty of, uh, plenty of people who would like to participate. So that should be fun. Look forward to working with you on that. Um, again, if you have a hackathon idea, you can post it in the Slack channel. Uh, please do add a brief description to the shared Google Doc. And please upload a single PowerPoint slide on your hackathon idea, ideally by tonight at midnight. Um, if you absolutely need two slides, that's OK. But also make sure that your name is in the slide so that when we go through them, we know who to call uh, to present. Okay. Uh, resources. We have uh, 150 people registered for the course. Uh, we have uh, 80 people plus on the call today. And so uh, that's a lot of people. We have a good staff, uh, but it's certainly possible that uh, uh, we could have a little bit of overload. Um, so if for some reason you need extra help, uh, please don't hesitate to raise your hand. We have breakout rooms where we can have people uh, give you one-on-one -on -one assistance. Again, resources, the CompuCell website, uh, the student materials folder on the Google Drive, uh, I want to draw your attention again to the Tellurium manuals. There are also some very good videos on Tellurium that are available from Herbert's course of two weeks ago. Uh, I especially call your attention to the Slack and to the quick reference guides. Those quick reference guides are really helpful. Uh, there's a couple of page guide to Python that has everything you need and more. Uh, there's a great quick, start, quick reference guide to CompuCell 3D that will remind you of all the things that we cover in the class and some things we won't get to. Uh, and for subcellular network modeling, uh, there is a very good guide to Tellurium that in one column of text gives you everything you need to know. And so I strongly recommend printing those out and having them available, or at least having them bookmarked so that you can find them. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are a couple of other documents in the uh, student materials folder, um, talking about how CompuCell works internally. 
Uh, and there was a nice paper by a Canadian group of students on some of the general issues about modeling and computational mathematical biology uh, that we thought was worth taking a look at, although it's not specifically focused on what we're going to do for this class. Now I'd like to start the lecture proper. Um, the first thing that one might come to is asking the question, why bother with this kind of model? And you can come to that kind of uh, model from many different points of view. Um, one of the things that one might think about is that there are needs for novel approaches in medicine. Uh, if you want to be able to personalize medicine, if you want to be able to predict what's going to happen to a patient when you treat them in a particular way, um, you need to have models of how those patients behave. Um, and there's a whole set of concepts around the idea of medical digital twins uh, that are developing very rapidly. Uh, all of those are built around the idea of being able to build predictive quantitative models of complex biological processes. And so, so one of the key things that you need to be able to do is to be able to predict. And uh, this course will be focused on uh, building predictive models, not predictive models typically of individual patients, although that's certainly something that one would like to be able to do eventually. Uh, but in our case, more asking the question, how do tissues organize during development? How do they maintain themselves once you built the organism? Uh, how do developmental diseases cause disorganization of tissues? Uh, because we'll find that cancer and many other developmental diseases have uh, very great similarities with normal tissue development. We're going to talk a little bit about infectious diseases, how hosts and pathogens interact, and uh, one can use these methods also uh, in bioengineering, in particular tissue engineering, to try to understand how to repair tissues uh, or how to build engineered tissues. Uh, if we look especially at early embryonic development, we find that there is an enormous amount of movement uh, in tissues as they develop. Um, and one of the reasons that we developed CompuCell in the first place was to be able to understand and model that kind of cell movement. And in fact, CompuCell has been used to model intersegmental vessel growth in zebrafish, uh, branching morphogenesis, and segmentation. Uh, and so these are the kinds of deployments that CompuCell was initially developed for and has been used for pretty successfully. Um, there are a lot of similarities, and I'm not going to go into detail in any of these slides, uh, between uh, developmental mechanisms, maintenance mechanisms, and uh, the mechanisms that come into play in cancer. Uh, how tissues are maintained, how cells control their proliferation, how cell death is controlled are all things that are of importance in all three of those contexts. Um, the difference between stem cells and somatic cells and differentiation are also important in all of those contexts. And those are things that uh, you can build CompuCell models to understand. Tissue organization is also something that we're going to discuss a bit. Um, the initial things we're going to do with CompuCell are going to be mesenchymal cells. Uh, that's the natural, simplest kind of cell. But we're going to show you how to build models of epithelial cells, that is, polarized cells that form layered structures, and to understand how those work. Uh, the extracellular environment is going to be important as well to how tissues organize. Uh, CompuCell does not do a lot <coughs> of extracellular solid modeling, uh, but it is good at modeling extracellular chemical fields, and you can implement some uh, ECM solids also with it, although that's not something we're going to talk about in great detail today. Uh, TJ has done a good deal of work on building quasi-solid models using this kind of methodology. One of the things that motivated a project like CompuCell is that there isn't a clear mapping between genes and cell behaviors. 
If you ask the question, for example, what genes cause cancer, uh, beyond P53 and one or two other genes, there are very few genes that are mutated in most cancers because cancer is really a disease of cell behavior. It's cells behaving in a way that they shouldn't in the context they find themselves in. And there usually are many molecular ways of doing the same thing. And so really what matters very often is not so much specific molecules, but rather cell behaviors. And CompuCell is going to be built around the idea that cell behaviors are critical to understanding how tissues are built, maintained, and how they fail. Uh, more generally, quantitative modeling is important because biology is full of what are called uh, feedback and uh, inco what are called incoherent feed forward networks. So if I imagine that molecular species A excites the production of B, promotes the production of B, and promotes the production of C, B promotes the production of D, but C inhibits D, and I increase A, I don't know from looking at that diagram whether increasing A increases or decreases D. Similarly, if I have a cell that's migrating on a substrate, say agar, and I change the stiffness of the substrate, I don't a priori know whether the cell is going to move faster or slower. And so this kind of modeling that we're going to do is really critical when it's very difficult to extrapolate from molecular signatures to cell and tissue behaviors. The particular question that you're going to work on in any given case will determine the level of detail, spatial and otherwise, that you need. Um, and it's always worth asking the question, uh, is it worth building a complicated model? Sometimes very simple models are sufficient. Uh, and that would come up a lot, for example, in some disease models. And so as you're working, especially if you're going to do the hackathon, you should be asking the question for yourself, what is the simplest model that I could build uh, that would give me the answers that I want? What is it that I want to understand? What are virtual tissues? Virtual tissues are the kinds of simulations that we're going to build in this class. Uh, typically, they start with some kind of concept of subcellular regulation. Uh, that could be a network or a logical diagram or something else. A set of cell behaviors that we're going to implement using the cellular POTS model GGH method that CompuCell uses. And then an extracellular layer of chemical network of oscillators. Uh, those oscillations are in turn controlled by an extracellular gradient of a morphogen, in this case FGF8. And when that morphogen reaches a critical level, the cells differentiate depending on the oscillator and then change their mechanical behaviors that leads to segmentation. These are mechanistic, dynamic, agent-based multiscale models. And our focus is going to be on spatiotemporal structure and behaviors. Uh, they're mechanism driven, they're not data driven, and they're additive. Nothing exists in your model unless you assert it. Not even the, thing, the statement that cells have a volume exists unless you assert it. And they're going to be based on quantitative models of how objects behave. You'll have models of how cells are born or created, how they die, what forces they create, how they change shape, how they move, and the typical output of these models is movies. And then, of course, you'll also do analysis of those time series uh, to get numerical results that you can compare to experiments. One dream that we've had uh, for a long time is that you could take the molecular detail in static images, so-called uh, tissue atlas data, use those as initial conditions for simulations and animate the dead tissue to predict what would have happened. And that's something that we're working on quite a bit 
And if people are interested in discussing that more later, we'd love to talk about it. Uh, these are not easy problems to work on. Uh, biology is hard. Uh, there are lots of components. There are lots of component types. There are lots of parameters. We don't always know how things work. Uh, biology is intrinsically noisy and stochastic. Individual components of the same type may not be the same in detail. Even the same cell will behave differently when I change its environment. All of our models are phenomenological. None of them are going to have all the details in them. And sometimes comparing experiment and simulation isn't so easy because, for example, if I grow a blood vascular tree, each time I grow that vascular tree, that network will be different. How do I compare a random network of blood vessels produced by a simulation to one from an experiment? Those are things that are still open scientific problems in many areas. And so there are a lot of things that we have to address when we build these models. But that's not a council of despair. It means there's a lot to do, and it can be rather enjoyable to do those things. So now I'd like to get everybody up and running uh, with CompuCell. Um, just to begin with, I want to do a very, very simple exercise. Uh, please, everybody, go to the uh, CompuCell tool on NanoHub. That's the CC3D Base 4X tool. And if somebody could post that in the chat for me, that would be great. Okay. And I'll use my poll to uh, ask everybody. able to get into NanoHub. If you're using the desktop app, that's fine. Click yes, that's fine too. Okay, it looks like everybody pretty much is getting there. I'll wait another minute or two to make sure that it's working for people. If you're on this screen, you hit launch tool and it'll ask me to log in. And in my case, you can sign in with Google if you're not in an institution that they recognize, or you can create an account here. I can sign in with Indiana University. And it knows who I am, so it'll go up for me. Once you've gotten there, you want to do, if you haven't done it before, uh, you, NanoHub uses something called the dashboard. To get to the dashboard, you can either go to dashboard here, you can hover up here and get dashboard or go up to the top right where it says logged in and select dashboard. And then you can go to all tools. And if you haven't done it already, you can look for CompuCell. It'll give you a variety of options. Uh, the one we're going to use here is this uh, CompuCell v4 main tool and hit the little heart here to bookmark it so that it is available to you. And then hit the uh, window here to launch it. And so now I'd like to double check and make sure that everybody can get CompuCell to launch. And occasionally CompuCell is buggy online and Uh, if it gets buggy, I recommend hitting terminate and relaunch. Okay, so everybody seems to be okay on that. And our first exercise will be running a very simple simulation. Uh, CompuCell comes packaged. 
uh, with a variety of demonstrations, some of which we'll use. Uh, you'll also be writing your own code. CompuCell has two main tools. Uh, CompuCell Player, which is what you're seeing on the screen now, which is for executing and simulations and controlling them, and Twitit++, which is a model editor uh, where you're going to develop and change the simulations. Okay. Uh, you're inside of NanoHub, you're going to be able to resize your window. Uh, you can change the size of the viewing windows as well. You can move the boundaries of your boxes around. Something that may happen to you when you're using CompuCell online is that NanoHub doesn't always redraw the screen properly. And if you get a messy screen, if you grab that bottom right-hand corner uh, and joggle it a little bit, if it'll let me do it. Sometimes it can miss, it can be annoying as well. Uh, it will let you, it will redraw the screen for you there. So if you get a messed up screen, I recommend uh, resizing a little bit, okay? So to open a simulation, uh, we can go to file. I'm sorry, I'm running the code, so I have to stop it. It's one problem I started, I tried it out this morning and I had it set in a wrong computer. So go to file and go to open simulation at the top and click on your username. And you should find something which is called CompuCell 3D, de CompuCell demos here. I have to find it. It's, uh, you should have a simpler directory structure than I do because I have a lot of uh, these. CompuCell 3D demos. Inside of CompuCell 3D demos, uh, there should be a simulation called, let's see, did I go to the wrong place? Demos again, extra layer of demos, and then book chapters. And then angiogenesis. Does everybody have that hierarchy? It's listed here on the screen. OK, somebody says that they need some help. So if I could ask our assistants to contact the person who needs help and uh, move them into a breakout room if necessary. If you need help, please use the chat or raise your hand uh, using the Zoom and uh, we'll get you the help you need. Okay, try that again on the poll just to make sure that everybody's caught up. So the full path for the demo. Um, it may look slightly different in your computer. Click on your username. And then once you get to your username, you should find a folder called CompuCell 3D underscore demos. Inside of demos, there is a folder called demos. Inside of that folder, there's something called book chapter demos. And inside that folder is something called angiogenesis.
And again, if people need help, we can, we'll come back to this. So if it's a problem, uh, let's, uh, we can, we'll, you'll have plenty of chance to practice. So don't worry too much. Uh, select angiogenesis.cc3d and hit open. And once you've started that, you've now got that file loaded. and you'll see a set of four buttons at the top of your player. This round circle is step. Oh, bug. That's interesting. Is that not bullseye? Let me try that again. Well, TJ, I seem to have a problem with running my own demo. I'm going to do what I suggested, which is hit terminate and relaunch. Did anybody else have a problem with that? Everybody else had it crash as well? Oh, did I open? There we go. Open file. Demos. The chapter. Antigenesis. Um, Well, this isn't going to be the best start to the to the course if we can't get this to run. I'll try one more time, and if I can't do it, I'm going to turn it over to the team to get it working, and I'll move ahead to the rest of the lecture. Hmm. Let's see, last time. Microsoft main tool. Launch. Open simulation. Click on my username. Dr. Selfie through new demos, demos, book chapter, angiogenesis, angio. Oh. There we go. So who else can run? Was my ever people able? People seem to say mine runs, but doesn't show video. It runs, it runs, third rerun. Okay, somebody, TJ says it may be a problem with NanoHub service. That's yeah. possible. Yeah, so this happens sometimes, especially when a lot of people sign in all at once. So if we just hang in there, um, probably everyone with the desktop app isn't seeing this issue um, and it should resolve itself here pretty quickly. 
Okay. Um, may I ask which one? Is this the Angio uh, Genesis or the other longer name? Angiogenesis.cc3d. Okay. So somebody or... asked the question, legitimate question, how many people is too many people? And the answer is once everybody is in, it should be fine because NanoHub has a lot of servers, uh, but it's possible that if too many people try to load the file at the same time, it's having a problem. So let me try again, now that it seems to be working for me. Uh, it's definitely was not a problem with the, with the package. Um, so let's see, how's it going? Okay, again, if people need help, we can move you to a breakout room if you identify yourself. What you see on the screen may vary a little bit. I want to emphasize that there are four buttons. Uh, the first button is run, which will run the simulation. The second button is a single step, which will advance the simulation one step and then wait. The third button is a pause button, which pauses and then lets you do a single step or run again. And the last button with the square is stop, and stop will reset the simulation to the beginning and start over. Okay. Um, you should see a simulation window that looks like this. And there are a couple of things that you want to learn about it. One is how to resize it. You can drag it, resize it using the usual buttons. There's a very helpful tool, which is if I go up under window and I hit the second option, which is tile, that will lay out the screen in a way that makes sense. A third thing that you might want to know is that you can display in two dimensions or three dimensions. Uh, you probably started in your case in a two dimensional simulation. If you want to see in 3D, you select 3D. So why don't people try that? And then you can pan and rotate your simulation. Occasionally the simulation will get lost. If you hit R while you're hovering over the simulation, it should recenter it and bring it back. So why doesn't everybody select 3D and hit play and see the simulation run? Okay, again, are the people who are trying to, who need help raising their hands or otherwise connecting with our assistants to do the help? Okay, so you now have a running simulation of uh, neoangiogenesis. Um, again, if you get the simulation off in a funny situation, uh, you can hit R to recenter and restore it to its original value. And you can use the mouse uh, roller to, to zoom in. You can move over the mouse, the mouse over there to change the view and so on. So why don't people just take a second or two to try that out? Let me look at the chat. Somebody says they're running on the desktop and it works. Uh, zoom in, zoom out is your uh, roller bar on your mouse, or you can use the zoom button here, zoom in, zoom out. One of the things about uh, the CompuCell interfaces is that there are a lot of different options for doing the same thing. And so I tend to use the same ones over and over again, but you may prefer something else. There are a lot of shortcuts and options uh, for doing these things. 
And so you have to decide which ones are the ones that are most comfortable for you. Uh, how are we doing in terms of getting people, uh, getting the exercise working? Uh, I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Uh, if people need help getting the exercise working, please reach out to one of our instructors through the chat. Okay, and I'll read Paul in just a second. Okay. Um, CompuSil offers a lot of visualization options. Uh, those visualization options can be accessed here. Uh, depending on whether you're in 2D or 3D, you may want to render uh, the cells, the cell borders. Um, if you have subcellular elements, cluster borders, uh, and a variety of other options there. Um, I'm not going to play with those very much at the moment but there are plenty of things you can play with. The other thing that you can do is this uh, rather cryptic icon that's called configuration here uh, will allow you to change various settings. Um, there you can ask your simulation to save images and save movies uh, using the output option. Uh, you can set uh, a little bit about how the player is configured under general settings. We don't use that one so much. If I don't like blue as the color of my cells under cell color, I can select a different color for it. Maybe since they're vascular, I'll make them red. We haven't looked at the chemical fields yet. In 3D, sometimes you want to have some of your cell types be invisible so you can see inside of a 3D object. Uh, you can set that here under 3D. And then there are various other kinds of access settings, which we're not going to worry about so much here. Again, one of the things you'll find in CompuCell is that there are an awful lot of options um, and it takes some time to explore them. One of the things that you're going to face here, you might try changing the color of your cells here, uh, if you like, as we're talking. One of the things that this particular simulation has of blood vessels is that blood vessel growth depends on a growth factor. Uh, it's called vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, A, and there's a chemical field. So if I go under uh, here, this button here, it says new graphics window, or if I pull down on window here, new graphics window, I can create a second graphics window. Why doesn't everybody follow along and do that? And I can say that instead of seeing the cells, I want to see the chemical concentration. And now I have to relay out my screen because I've hidden part of my screen. I go to window and I hit tile. And here I have my vascular endothelial growth factor field on the left and my cell field on my right. Generally, when you do a major change in the way the cell, the fields that cells are displayed, the simulation will pause and I have to hit run again to continue the simulation. So why doesn't everybody just take a second or two to play with that a little bit and see what happens. You can do a 3D visualization of the field, although that's a little bit uh, more complicated to interpret. That's going to give you isosurfaces of the chemical concentration. So is everybody able to get that to work? People still having problems. And you can see that these endothelial cells have organized to form uh, a three-dimensional network of capillaries. Again, I see people saying needing help. Um, if you need help, please do reach out and uh, ask, for, ask for help.
Somebody says, I can't see any output. Uh, my window is black. Um, are you, if the person, are you, is the person who said that running on a desktop machine? Um, okay, yes, you should, you do have to do the, you do have to do a tile usually uh, to make sure that things are well behaved. And again, if you hover over a window and you hit R, that should recenter things. Um, sometimes when I change the cell border and color and rerun the simulation, the cell color remains the same in the screenshot. Um, okay. Yes, Giuliano. Sometimes you will actually get uh, a simulation to disappear. Um, there is a bug that's possible. Um, to reset the rotation to the 3D visualizations so that both have the same orientation. That's a good question. And I believe it's possible to do with text, uh, but I don't think there's any way to scroll both of them simultaneously. So you'd have to, you'd have to reset the orientation and then uh, do the scroll separately in the two. Good point. Um, sometimes when I change the cell board, cell color and board and rerun the simulation, um, the color doesn't, uh, doesn't change. Can't see both graphs at the same time. Try to use the layout, the tile. Can you see the initial conditions? Um, Pedro, if you're having a crash, make sure you're running the copy that's in your user directory and not the copy that's in the CompuCell root directory. Let me show you the initial conditions. If you want to see the initial conditions, hit stop and then hit step. A single step. Okay, so that's the initial condition. Here, a cube of cells and no chemical field. And if I step one at a time, those cells begin to secrete vascular endothelial growth factor and they begin to reorganize and if I were going to reorganize things to try to make the, the uh, configurations match, I would do it now probably. And I have to play around with it a little bit to try to get them oriented in the same way. That's not too bad, I think. And now I can run. Again, this was just a first exercise. I understand that some people may have uh, an issue. Uh, I'm going to monitor the chat here. When you change the color, the color setting, you have to remember to hit OK after you've changed the color, or it won't save it. There, it didn't change. So I guess that's a problem I'm having as well. That's interesting. I haven't seen that one before. Let me try it again, change the color. Endothelial cell, color. All right. So one of the excitements of this course is that you never know what's going to happen, including when I run things. And so I appreciate your patience that when these things happen. Server disconnected. That one I will have to refer you to one of our team to help you out with. Okay. I'll let that run, and now I want to talk a little bit more about CompuCell. Again, uh, in the next module, we'll be doing a lot more about these things, and we'll have plenty of time to get any bugs worked out. Um, one of the key things that we see in this simulation is that we have cells, uh, individual cells. Let me go into 2D and show the cells. Um, maybe zoom in a little bit so we can see them better. The borders are not very easy to see. So let me change the border color. Let's see, cell border color. 
instead of yellow, let's make it black so it's clear. And here we see the individual cells, and we see these cells are composed of pixels with boundaries. And if we're going to describe what they're doing, we have to describe what the configuration of the cells is, what forces are acting on them, causing them to move, and the rules for how they move. And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, there's a rather old book now that talks about some of these that you might want to look at. Uh, you can represent cells as points. Some people may have taken Paul Macklin's class last week. Uh, those are point-like cells. Um, these are called center model simulations. There are many different uh, modeling environments that use center models. Um, there also are cells which have explicit shapes. Uh, CompuCell is an example of that. There are other simulation environments like Morpheus, Virtual Leaf, uh, that use the POTS model algorithm. Uh, there are so-called called vertex models uh, that are used, uh, especially for modeling things like uh, fruit fly development. And they're more finite element-like models, which have very explicit mechanical descriptions of cell surfaces. Uh, those models tend to be very detailed, uh, computationally expensive, uh, but also very uh, productive if you want to understand biophysics of tissues. If you want to learn a little bit more about the methodologies in CompuCell, uh, there's a nice book from a few years ago by Shana and Preziosi, uh, that actually shows the simulation we're running here. Um, this simulation is the one here on the cover of that book. Uh, again, CompuCell represents cells on the lattice. You'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Uh, each cell consists of multiple voxels or pixels. Um, and so it's a little bit like pointing a camera at the cells and saying that every voxel in cell number one is number one, every voxel in cell number two is number two. Uh, CompuCell has a lot of core ideas about how cells behave and what they do. Uh, and remember that these are constructive models, nothing exists unless you assert it. And so cells have to be given things like volume, uh, surface area, uh, viscosity, elasticity, uh, polarity, uh, their behaviors like cell movement, cell growth, cell death, uh, and their interactions like cells sticking to each other, uh, responding to chemical fields, differentiating, secreting chemicals, absorbing chemicals. There are mechanical structures called links that we'll talk about on the last day of the class that allow you to build quasi-solid materials. Um, there are chemical fields, when you're seeing one here on the right, uh, in the case of VEGF, those can diffuse and decay. They can also react. And there can be subcellular networks that can model signaling and regulation and control. In this particular simulation, there are no subcellular networks. The specific numerics of how these are done are things that Giuliano is going to talk, I said, Giulio is going to talk about a little bit. Um, when you model things like cell adhesion, you have to imagine that each surface unit, here a yellow cell is touching a green cell, uh, has an energy associated with it. And so you'll see a term called contact energy that describes how cells stick together. Mathematically, that's Hello again, James. I think you're back. You're I'm back. Is my screen share working? Uh, no, your screen share 
uh, is missing. Okay. Well, if if this is this may be good because if all the bugs happen in this first lecture, then maybe there won't be any more bugs for the rest of the class. So one of the things that we'll learn quickly is that we specify a lot of cell properties in the form of what are called elastic constraints. In this case, we sell that the cell <clears throat> the cell wants to have a volume of V target, and there's a penalty associated with that cell not having its target volume. And again, this is something that Giuliano will come and Julia will come back to later. In the, day. the way in which things move is a little bit complex. If you haven't had physics, uh, these are based on some properties of what's called statistical mechanics. Um, copy cells, what's called a stochastic model. At each time step, micro time step within a simulation, it looks at the boundaries of each cell. It tries to move randomly the boundaries forward and backwards. It asks the question, does the energy of the system change? That is, is there a force on that boundary? And it makes that move with a probability that's associated with a fluctuation amplitude. The details we're not going to go into here. The key thing to know is that the result is that boundaries move with a velocity that's proportional to the force. And in the subcellular world that we're working in, there's almost no inertia. If you stop pushing on something, the boundaries stop moving. And so you want to be in what's called the overdamped limit where the velocity is proportional to the force. And the details of this uh, you'll hear about a little later. This method breaks down if I push too hard. Uh, and what you'll see then if you push too hard is that your cells begin to fragment and become dust-like. And that's a particular pathology of this modeling method that we'll come back to. And now for the rest of the lecture, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the kinds of questions you can answer with CompuCell. We're a little bit behind in terms of my timing, but we still have half an hour to go over some things that you can do with it. Um, these are questions that we've asked over the years uh, in our group, but there are many others that have been asked. Everything from why do blood vessels sometimes invade the retina in age-related macular degeneration, uh, to could we personalize treatments for diabetic retinopathy? Two, why do some people have a lethal cystic outgrowth in their kidneys? Two, why does acetaminophen sometimes cause liver necrosis? Uh, those all seem very diverse. Uh, they're all problems that have been addressed with CompuCell uh, models of one sort or another. Um, if we go back a long way, uh, one of the very first simulations that was done was based on experiments where you mix two cell types and you ask the question, how do the cells reorganize when they have particular surface adhesion properties? And that's a simulation we used to use as our first simulation. Uh, these days we tend to avoid it, uh, but if you want to run the cell sorting simulation as a demo uh, while I'm talking, you can do that. You can find that simulation in those demo directories. Um, clearly, we need cells to be able to grow and divide. Uh, this is a simulation of somatic evolution in a simplified tumor uh, derived from the work of Heiko Enderling, who's now the head of the Society for Mathematical Biology. Uh, in this case, the yellow cells represent stem cells. The red cells represent somatic cancer cells. You see those cells growing and dividing and filling the space uh, that's available to them. That's very easy to implement with a, a target volume because you could have the target volume of the cells increase and then have them divide. And you'll hear about that tomorrow. I've already shown you the idea of a chemical field. In this case, in this middle column, the cells in red are secreting a chemical. That chemical is diffusing and decaying in the extracellular environment and leading to the formation of a gradient of that chemical concentration, which is the color scheme that you see here in this middle row. Cells could also respond to chemicals by chasing the chemical, by moving up or down gradient, that's called chemotaxis. This is a classic simulation where we have simulated 
uh, leukocytes, which are chastely bacteria. The blue cells would represent the leukocytes. The green cells would be bacteria. The bacteria secrete a chemical that the leukocytes recognize and chase. Uh, that chemotaxis is also happening here in the angiogenesis simulation. These cells that we've shown here in the angiogenesis simulation are very simple. They're just blobs of material. Uh, but you could build more complex simulations where the cells have detail. Uh, this is a simulation of a crawling cell where the cell has a nucleus here in gray, a lamellipodium in green, and a cytoplasm, which is made invisible so that you can see the nuclear and lamellipodium parts. Uh, you could also model chemical movement within the cells, and Julio's done a lot of work on that. I've mentioned the possibility of modeling uh, epithelial tissues, uh, layered tissues, and so you could use subcellular compartments to define apical, basal, and lateral surfaces of cells. Uh, Julio has taken that uh, to quite elaborate lengths, uh, modeling, for example, the origin of polarity in cells uh, through chemical signaling within the cell. And so people who are interested in modeling what's going on in, inside of cells uh, are able to do that as well. Here's another one of Julio's simulations, in this case showing the patterning of hair cells in a Drosophila uh, imaginal wing disc. This is again a simulation where the individual molecular species inside the cell and their interactions across the cell boundaries are modeled explicitly. I just showed that simulation of a crawling cell uh, one of the things that's quite interesting about cells is they have very specific statistical behaviors. When they crawl, uh, they do what are called persistent random walks. And that's a simulation that you'll learn how to write and run. And one of the things you could do is say, if a single cell behaves in a particular way, what happens when you have multiple cells interacting with each other? And Professor Tomas from, from Brazil will show you how to do that. This is the simulation that we just ran in the 3D version on the right. Uh, this is actually an old experiment by Ambrosi et al. showing human umbilical vein endothelial cells organizing to form a vascular pattern. And this was old work that we did trying to understand what specific mechanisms the cells needed to have in order to be able to make a vascular network. Uh, in this case, the simulation comes in two flavors. The cells respond to the chemical by chemotaxing, moving up gradients of the chemical. <clears throat> in this case, on the right, uh, the contacts between cells, the regions where the cells are touching each other, don't respond to the chemical, and they form a network. On the left, all surfaces of the cell respond, and they form droplets instead. And that's a simulation we could actually run very easily here on the right with a single line change in the code. Uh, you can take those blood vessel networks and have them act as sources of nutrients for cells. Uh, and this is a simulation of a vascular tumor where an initial tumor cell in the middle uh, receives nutrients from the blood vessels. It proliferates as the tumor grows the cells in the middle of the tumor become nutrient deprived. They first become quiescent and then necrotic. Uh, and you'll see that there's a necrotic core in this simulation. Uh, in the first case, those cells that are quiescent and don't have enough oxygen send out a growth factor that causes proliferation of blood vessels. Those are the purple lines here. Uh, in the second case that they don't, the blood vessels stay put. They're still pushed around by the growing tumor, but they don't proliferate. In both cases, the tumor grows, but the pattern of tumor growth is quite different. And you can understand the interaction between blood vessels and tumors using models of that kind. Uh, this was a simulation of uh, evolutionary effects in tumors. Uh, cancers are notoriously prone for developing a resistance to chemotherapies and radiation. Uh, during the progress of cancer, uh, you have what are called the hallmarks of cancer as cells become uh, more motile, uh, less responsive to signals for 
inhibition of cell proliferation. Um, and this is a simulation of the evolution of those behaviors in a very simplified way. One of the things that I mentioned is that we can try to do things that are more, these are very abstract models. Uh, we can try to build models that are more medically relevant. Uh, your retina has a very complex architecture. Uh, at the back of the retina is a thick membrane called Brooks membrane here in gray. Behind it are the choriocapillaris, the blood vessels that supply the majority of oxygen and glucose to the retina and get rid of most of the waste products. Uh, when you have a retinal scan, the, ret the blood vessels that you see are only a fraction of the blood vessels that actually supply the retina. In front of the Brooks membrane, you have the black uh, pigmented retinal epithelial cells that line the eye. And then on top of them, you have the photoreceptor. Uh, and that's the basic structure of the retina. Uh, in a certain number of people, especially older adults, although also in people who get eye infections uh, or who have uh, trauma to the eye, mechanical trauma to the eye, uh, these blood vessels, the choriocapillaris, uh, cross Brooks membrane and begin to proliferate inside of the retina. And when they do that, uh, you can go blind within a period of 60 months to a year. And this was work that we did a number of years ago, trying to understand the mechanisms behind that. Um, at the time, there were no good uh, treatments for this problem. And we built a simulation of the retina. Here are those, in gray are those Brooks membrane. The purple cells are the uh, blood vessels behind the retina. Green are the pigmented retinal cells. And here in dark gray are the photoreceptors. Uh, there's a small hole in Brooks membrane. The blood vessels penetrate into the retina. They begin to proliferate in the retina. And as they proliferate, they spread and they eventually will cause retinal detachment. There, and the breakup of the retina with the loss of vision. Uh, this was a simulation where we actually calibrated the parameters pretty carefully. And so the number of days here is in, represents real time, and the simulation is able to replicate the time scale over which this is observed to happen in real individuals. And one of the things that was quite interesting was we were able to investigate what happens if you in fact change the adhesion of the pigmented cells to Brooks membrane, of the pigmented cells to each other, of the pigmented cells to the photoreceptors, each one of those causes a problem in the retina, but a different problem. And we were able to build what's called a risk map that identifies what the likely effect of a particular mechanical defect at the cell level is at the system level. As you age, inevitably, lipids build up on Brooks membrane. It's not replaced. Uh, during your life. Uh, and that means that the pigmented retinal epithelial cells stick less strongly to Brooks membrane than they would otherwise. It's one of the reasons adult, uh, older people are more likely to get retinal detachments. Uh, and that increase of lipid with aging is the primary risk factor here in red for this kind of retinal invasion and breakup. And so that actually gave some ideas about new ways of approaching uh, treatment of diabetic retinopathy. Mean, it's not, I say diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration associated uh, choroidal neovascularization. You've seen this simulation of segmentation before. Again, this is a model with detailed subcellular oscillator, uh, model of cell differentiation, and a model of extracellular chemicals. Uh, Giulio Belmonte, in his PhD thesis, worked with a group uh, in London that discovered that you could get the same thing to happen even if you didn't have the chemical oscillators or the gradient. And so Giulio worked uh, to build a mechanical model of cell polarization and reorganization of epithelia uh, that was able to explain uh, why you were able actually to get this kind of uh, segmental patterning, even in the absence of those oscillatory states. 
And that's a simulation that is a little bit complicated, but something if somebody wants to work on in a, in a hackathon, Julia might be able to help out with that. In this case, you have cells that are, have compartments. You have an apical surface here in green, basal surface in red, medial-lateral surface in blue, the cells elongate. These lines are those links that I talked about earlier. Uh, in green here is extracellular material uh, between the cells. And you can build then these kinds of reorganization models. Uh, this is another model of the same kind of process uh, done by Priam, who was a graduate student here, who's now postdoc at Duke, um, looking at the organization of an epithelial layer uh, what's called apical contraction in the top of the cells, uh, leading to the failure of the epithelial layer and the formation of clusters. Another thing that we've worked on from a more medical point of view is something called autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. It's a genetic disease. Uh, at the moment, it's treatable only with a kidney transplant. It's associated with a mutation in two genes. Uh, polycystin 1 and 2, uh, but exactly how those gene mutations translated into the cystic phenotype wasn't understood. Um, our experimental collaborators, uh, clinician uh, Dr. Bob Bakayao, who's a surgeon, kidney surgeon at our medical school, uh, hypothesized that it was due to an adhesion defect uh, where the adhesion between the cells in the kidney was not appropriate. Um, this is a simulation of a small section of kidney tubule. Uh, we've introduced a single cell, which has a different cadherin in it, a different cell adhesion molecule in it uh, from the normal one. Uh, that leads to interference with contact inhibition of proliferation, the signaling that tells the tissue that it's intact. So this is a normal tissue repair mechanism that is getting misdeployed. Uh, that failure to respect that signal to say, don't divide, leads to inappropriate cell division in the formation of cysts. We were able to test various hypotheses about how that uh, missing information played out at the tissue level. Uh, this was a experiment uh, done using a kidney cell line, uh, which had been transfected uh, with this ectopic adherin, this inappropriate cell adhesion molecule. Uh, what you see is that the cells in green are the ones that have the wrong cell adhesion molecule and they're forming cysts. And that gave us some insight that we've used to try to develop uh, drug therapies to treat this disease. Uh, Juliana, uh, Julio will be showing you a simulation of what's called convergent extension. Uh, this is a process that occurs early in development in many animals uh, where tissues uh, shrink along one direction and extend along another direction. This is simulating the filopodial contraction of cells uh, here in two dimensions, here in three dimensions. And that's a simulation you'll do later in the week. Another thing that we could simulate, and this is a new simulation, is uh, signaling between cells. Uh, using a pair of cell adhesion molecules called delta and notch. Uh, the delta and notch uh, form, uh, I wrote it called a heterotypic pair. Delta on cell one binds to notch on cell two. Uh, notch then gets cleaved and the intracellular component of notch sends a signal. Uh, that signal in turn leads to cell proliferation and you get a particular kind of patterning of the tissue uh, where cells are either high delta or high notch, uh, and the proliferation of the cells also then depends on the delta notch levels. That's another simulation that you'll learn how to build and operate later in the week. One of the things that everybody has done a lot of in the past, <laughs> in the past year and a half is modeling of of um, viruses and immune response. This is a detailed model that TJ built uh, of a patch of lung tissue. 
the lung tissue has an initial infection with the virus, in this case, modeling influenza virus, uh, the infected cells send out a variety of chemical signals. Those chemical signals lead to the invasion of the tissue by a variety of immune cells. There are quite a few here. There are neutrophils, CD4 plus T cells, B cells, antigen presenting cells, natural killer cells, and CD8 plus T cells. So quite a few cell types. Uh, and there also is quite a bit of signaling going on. Uh, there are TNF alpha, uh, a variety of interleukins, a reactive oxygen species, which the immune cells use to kill infected cells. Uh, there's type one interferon, type two interferon and antibodies. And in this case, you're actually able to calibrate this simulation against very detailed data for influenza infection in mouse lung and able to reproduce the difference between low level infection, a low dose of infection early on and a high dose of infection uh, leading to different outcomes in the mouse. You can use that kind of modeling also to model uh, drug therapies. Uh, these were some preliminary work we did last year uh, modeling remdesivir therapy. Uh, in this case, remdesivir uh, inhibits the replication of viral RNA when the virus has gotten into a cell. Uh, in that simulation, every single cell had its own model of viral replication. Uh, you can also have your own model of interferon-induced antiviral resistance, uh, and you're able to simulate what happens uh, if you give the drug, in this case, the blocker of, of RNA synthesis, at different times after infection. At the left, we give it at the same time you're infected. At the right, as we go right, we give it later and later times. At the top, we give a very high dose of the drug. At the bottom, we give a low dose. And the coloring essentially represents uh, whether the treatment worked or not. These lines represent the number of uninfected cells that are present in the simulation. Uh, if the line goes down, it means that all the cells in that patch of lung tissue are becoming infected. That's bad. Uh, and we're able then to come up with a result that tells us that uh, unsurprisingly, the earlier you treat, the better, the higher, the stronger you treat, the better. Those aren't too surprising. But the shape of the boundary between those two regions is rather interesting. And you also see, if you were able to, if you zoomed in a little bit, that there are many regions in which some patches have successful treatment and some don't. One of the things that I mentioned early on is that biology is highly stochastic. And so we have to deal with the fact that our simulations uh, represent one replica of potentially many, many, many different outcomes. And so one thing that we'll do later in the class is teach you how to do replica simulations and parameter scans to try to understand the details of the stochasticity. An area that we've worked in quite a bit more recently is diabetic retinopathy. Uh, it's an increasingly frequent cause of adult blindness. <clears throat> Again, like with age-related macular degeneration, uh, there aren't really very good treatments for it. Uh, the main way that it's treated these days, first I should say, what happens is that the capillaries now on the front of the retina uh, become uh, tortuous and they start getting leaky and they also die. And that leads to dropout, that is, patches of the retina that die. And the main way it's treated today is by going in with the laser and actually killing the photoreceptors, which need oxygen. Uh, and this is on the principle of uh, forest fire fighting, where you cut down trees to try to prevent the fire from spreading. The problem at the moment is that the way the trees are cut down, or in this case, the way the photoreceptors are wiped out, uh, is essentially. Uh, unintelligent, uh, you see essentially a random or almost a grid-like spot pattern. Uh, and so what we tried to do was calculate where there was likely to be a problem in the retina and suggest that you should try killing the cells where there was likely to be a problem so that you should build your fire break uh, where it was needed, not in random locations. And if you do that, you can reduce the area of damage uh, from the treatment itself and also reduce the risk of spread of the vascular damage. 
that's a project I'd love to get back to. It got a little bit thrown off course uh, by COVID. Um, and so if somebody were interested in working in that, that's something we could talk about as well. Another thing that we've worked on a lot is liver toxicity. Um, Tylenol or acetaminophen is a very common uh, headache medication uh, it's prescribed quite a bit. Um, it has the unfortunate effect that it can be very toxic to the liver. In fact, it can cause a death uh, from liver necrosis. And that's unfortunately rather common. Uh, one of the things that's a bit mysterious about acetaminophen is somebody can take it safely for a long period of time and then have a, a low level overdose that's lethal. We spent a number of years trying to understand the details of that. Um, these were simulations where we were trying to match uh, experimentally measured blood levels uh, versus time of acetaminophen and its metabolites uh, to a detailed simulation of flow in the liver, trying to understand which cells are exposed, why they're exposed, why they die, uh, and to build a more detailed model of how that toxicity happened. So that was a really lightning run through of a variety of problems that we've worked with over the years with CompuCell. Again, all of those were CompuCell models from our group. Uh, CompuCell has been used by a lot of groups over the worldwide uh, to build models. I don't mean to suggest that uh, the list of things that I've shown you uh, are by any means exhausted. There are plenty more things one could do with it. Uh, but I hope it gives you a sense of some of the possibilities that you can uh, achieve using CompuCell. I also realized that talking, showing one slide about cancer evolution or one slide about tumor vasculature isn't very satisfying. Uh, for each one of those slides, I would give a whole hour lecture on the details of the biology behind it, how the models are built, how they're validated and what they mean. Uh, but I thought to introduce the course, I'd like to come up with a list of just possibilities and some pretty movies uh, that would allow people to uh, have a sense of some of the possibilities of the things uh, that you could do with CompuCell going forward. Um, ultimately, uh, CompuCell has been mostly used for understanding the basic biology of development, tissue maintenance, that is homeostasis and developmental diseases, and more recently, uh, infectious diseases. Uh, it's been used also to predict effects of chemicals and drugs, both for toxicity and for treatment. Um, and I showed some examples of that. And in the future, we'd like to be able to design new therapies that polycystic kidney disease example is one uh, where we did come up with some drug targets based on those simulations. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to build personalized therapies. We'd like to be able to build models that actually represent not only generic cases, but specific individual cases. And I think in the case of tissue engineering, that's going to happen fairly soon. Um, and this kind of modeling, again, I started it out by saying you have to ask what kinds of questions you want to answer before you decide what kinds of models you're going to use. Uh, all of these models involve uh, spatial effects. Uh, things are not the same from one region of the tissue to another. Uh, if things are all the same, you can do simpler models that are a lot faster to run. Uh, and most of them involve cell movement. And so almost everything we're going to show you about simulation during this course will involve cells moving. Uh, in most of your body, cells move. Uh, depending on the tissue, that may be something that happens all the time, uh, or it may be something that happens with only a subset of the cells. It may be something that only happens, for example, when cells die and have to be replaced. Uh, there are a few tissues where you have relatively little cell movement. In the cornea of your eye, there's almost no cell movement. Um, in muscle, uh, cells don't move relative to each other very much during normal function. Uh, but when myofibers die, the remaining myofibers reorganize uh, to take up the missing space and fill in for the cells that have died. Uh, that's specific to humans, there are other animals in which my, uh, muscle fibers are replaced continually during life. 
So I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of the capabilities of CompuCell. I apologize for that snafu. Um, can I ask people, I'll, I'll poll, uh, I'll do one more poll. I'll do, first I'll do a quick poll. Um, sorry. Uh, on the, I'll relaunch that first poll. How many people were ultimately able to get the things to work for that simulation that I showed? If there was anybody who was not able to get it to work, uh, please do reach out during the break uh, to the uh, to one of the team uh, for help. And I want to end the end the uh, the the uh, module by asking you for your feedback. And I appreciate your patience with the uh, with the um, with the problem with the with the uh, the problem with the uh, can people see that poll? There we go. Um, the problem with the Nano Hub when we all tried to log in at once. I said we have a very large group. And so we have a bigger group today than before. And so we'd never, I think, had 70 people try to log into NanoHub all at once. So uh, I think that that's a problem. Once you're logged in, you shouldn't have any more problems. And so I hope that that's not going to be a snafu going forward. So please fill out this uh, end of module questionnaire. Uh, I really appreciate your feedback on that. I'll give people a few minutes uh, to do that. If there are any questions that you'd like to put in the chat now while we're doing the questionnaire, uh, feel free to, uh, to post them. And uh, let me know if there's anything I can do to help out. Okay, with that, uh, I'll leave the questionnaire up for another minute or two. We're scheduled for a 15 minute break. Uh, when we come back, uh, Giuliano is going to be taking over and we'll have plenty of practice uh, actually getting the NanoHub demos to work better than I guess I was able to do. So I thank you for uh, your participation in the first module. Uh, I hope things get uh, smoother as we go forward uh, from there. If anybody else has any comments or questions, uh, please let us know. And please do fill out the, the module questionnaire. We'd love to have your feedback. I'll leave it up for another minute. Uh, team, is there anything else that we need to go over uh, before we take our, our break? Um, I'm just going to ask people to download a zip file that I'm going to send the link now so that I can teach people how to upload uh, CC3D simulations to NanoHub. Okay. So is that going to be in the, uh, in the student materials? Yes, it's uh, there Google and app. I've um, sent the link straight to the file as well. Okay, okay so if people want to take the time over the break, uh, Giuliano will have a a file to download. One of the issues that you'll find with NanoHub is that uploading and downloading uh, takes a couple of steps. It only takes about a minute to do once you're familiar with it, but uh, we do have to show you the steps. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Appreciate your patience again. And I will turn it over to the break and I'll let Giuliano queue up.
Okay. Let's people have had time to take a break. And we're gonna get started again. Just give me a moment. Uh, Giuliano, your but our audio tends to be a bit quiet. Oh, okay. I'll I'll try to speak up, but okay, or get closer. Well, the mic is here, so okay. <laughs> um, not sure. Not sure if. Um. Okay, cool. So, share screen here. Okay. So, in this lecture, uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, uploading files to NanoHub. This would be, oh, yeah. And I, I should remind people before we start that we are live streaming to YouTube and recording. And those will be available afterwards. But I'll walk people through uploading files to NanoHub, uh, specifically zips and how to unzip them inside NanoHub. That will be useful later on if we want to do a more complex demo that would be too much to start from zero during the class. The demo that I will make, we will begin from zero. So, First, if people could download that file, um, believe the link should be there a few times. And we're gonna get started. So as I said, I'm gonna walk you through uploading to NanoHub and I will also show you how to make all of these pretty plots. So you can have time series of uh, cell populations, for instance, or you could have a scatter plot that is only for this time step. For instance, how much nutrients did your cells eat up? And you can also do histograms and such. And uh, Compass also allows you to create a custom heat map for your cells uh, to make data visualization e easier. So first is to download that file. You have the QR code there. If somebody else could post it again to chant, it would be nice. And the way we upload it to NanoHub is a bit strange because we are pushing the limits of NanoHub in this workshop. So the way we will do it is first uh, come to your dashboard, which you can click on logged in there or dashboard or the NanoHub icon there and go to all tools and search for Jupyter with a Y. And we want to launch the Jupyter notebook here. It's a good idea to place a heart next to the tool. That way it's gonna be here in favorites later on. So it's gonna be easier to access. Then this should bring you to a page like this and click on launch tool. And after a few moments, uh, this is where uh, this, this is what you be presented. Uh, so here, um, place. Okay. So in here in Jupiter, there is a upload button here at the top. Let me pass this line. So there is a upload here. We just need to click there, navigate to where you saved the zip file. Um, and to see the search bar here, you have to go to all tools under my tools. And it's Jupyter with a Y 
and you want the Jupyter notebooks. I, I realized that there are several here. So notebook one. So after you have it open, you click upload, you go to where you have your zip saved and you select the file you want to open. It's actually not yet uploaded. It's here and you have to click that second upload button again and it's gonna be somewhere in here in alphabetical order or however this is organized. So again, um, from the dashboard, go to all tools, Jupyter with Y, Jupyter notebook. You'll see something like this after opening it. And then this after launching. Oh, you have time. Then upload. Dashboard, all tools, Jupyter, launch it, upload, select the file you want to open or upload in this case. And uh, yeah, this is relevant only for the ones of us that are using Nanohub. If you're doing it locally, you don't need to bother with this part of the exercise. Oh, let me go again. Dashboard. All tools. Jupyter with Y. Jupyter Notebook, launch, upload, select the file, open, then upload again. Now, the next step, is to actually open CompuSol now. And again, that's in the dashboard. In this case, search for CompuSol 3D. All one word and open CompuSol 3D v4 main tool. Let me make that easier. So launch that too. Okay, so there are quite a few people that need more time. Uh, it, uh, yes, it has to be CompuSol 3D. Um, and it's best that you use v main 2. There are a few others that you could use. The thing is, is that there are some, uh, there are some tools that are old that won't have the functionality needed to unzip. And again, I recommend putting in a heart to favorite in the CompuSol afterwards. But now that you are in CompuSol, this is my screen. What we want to do you 
you have to upload a zip file, not a Jupyter file. But uh, so this is Jupyter, it's not Tellurium, which is also Jupyter. So that's another thing. So the notebook here, after you have it launched, upload there, select file, open, upload again. And after you've done that, you open CompuSelf for main tool, which is this link. And what we will do is open Twedit, which is CompuSelf's model editor software. Which you can do either on this icon here of a piece of paper and pen or uh, here, file start to edit. And that brings up another window and this is pretty much just as having a program open on a desktop. We have two windows, one with CC3D's players and one with Twedit. And I may be going a little bit fast, but this is not the most important part of the lecture. And again, the whole process is opening Jupyter Notebook here launch it. So this is the link to the Jupyter tool as well. Make things easier. Launch it, upload, select the file you want to upload, open and upload. And after that's uploaded, we go to the CompuCell tool, which is this link. And same, same deal. That link will bring you here. You launch the tool. And after the tool is launched, you can launch to edit either with that piece of paper and pen or file, start to edit. And if you're using, uh, if you're doing the workshop locally on your machine, you don't need to do anything right now. Yeah, Jupyter is only to upload the file. Uh, as I said, um, we are pushing the limits of NanoHub uh, in this workshop. Uh, NanoHub was NanoHub doesn't have a direct way for regular users to upload stuff, so we have to kind of trick NanoHub into allowing us to upload. And again, Jupyter is only for the upload, and you need to download the zip. You don't need to extract the zip locally. Um, if you're uploading into Jupyter, uh, because if you extract it locally, you're gonna have to upload each of the files separately. Then inside Jupyter, which is only for the upload, hit upload, select a file, open, and this upload that shows next to the file. And then we will unzip it in with uh, CompuCell. Yes. Yeah, people who are running in their own computer, not using NanoHub, again, you don't need to worry right now.
And after the upload, you come here, the CompuSelv4 main tool. Again, the steps for Jupyter on NanoHub. I'm not running Jupyter locally. Uh, yes, it's compatible with 425, even though there may be a, an error message, right? But it's compatible. And a warning message, actually. So on Jupyter, that upload there next to the new for new file. Go to where you saved that zip. Select the zip and open the UI is going to be different depending on your operating system. And then you hit, have to confirm the upload here. So upload there to actually select the file and then upload here to do the upload. Huh. Crash on Max is new. Ah. There we go. Afterwards, we come to the CC3 main tool and Okay, so people have caught up, seems like. So after you have the main tool, click either here, the paper with the pen, or here, uh, start to edit. That will, well, start to edit. And again, this is just like being on desktop with more than one program open. And here on Twedit, what we will do is come here to CC3D project. Then we'll open cc 3 project, which is this up arrow with a plate under it, which is the same symbol there. So clicking there would also work. So file start to edit here. Um, then come here to to edit and hit either this button or CC3 project, project, open CC3 project. Start to edit. open project. And then we you have to go to your user here um, and select the um, zip file that you uploaded, which in my case was this one. And CompuCell can just open zip files. It will extract the zip and open the, the files. Uh, we're going to see this warning and uh, yeah, this is just a warning. You don't need to worry about it. Then it should be here under foam. Where is foam? Foam simulation here. And that's it for uploading and unzipping. So, Again, open to edit, select the zip, just say okay for all the warnings. In my case, it didn't let me say okay because the folder was already there and it's gonna unzip the file. There. Then we can open the simulation by going where 
was unzipped and selecting the .cc2d file. Sorry, just let me break in for one second. Team members, if you are available to help somebody in a breakout room, please send me a chat message so that I know that you're available to help. And I promise the rest of the the rest of the lecture is actually easier than this. So the CC3D file huh, uh, should only appear after you unzip. I'm gonna guess that you already have unzipped. So in my case, it was actually doubly nested inside the simulation, and the CC3D should be next to simulation there. Hmm. Weird. Uh, wonder. Well, but at least you got it to unzip, which is the important part of this exercise. We're not actually going to use it for the rest of the lecture. Uh, what we are going to do the, for the rest of the lecture is um, I'm going to relaunch the pool in the meanwhile. Very weird. Yeah, and NanoHub is weird sometimes. Um, the, rest of the lecture, we are going to build a, the simulation I had you upload from scratch. And it's actually the simplest simulation you can do on CompuCell. So I promise you, the rest of the lecture is easier than this part. So what we are going to do now, and now this exercise is for everyone, those running on NanoHub and otherwise, is we are going to start a new simulation here. So with Twedit open, we are gonna come to CC3 project and select new CC3 project there at the top. And this is gonna bring up the simulation wizard, which is not rendering right for me. Okay, cool, just needed to drag down. So first things first, uh, the default directory is this, where CompuCell is installed on NanoHub. If you try to use that directory, NanoHub will complain, and you won't be able, able to do anything, actually. So first thing is to select your user here. So browse and your user. If you're doing it locally, you can select anywhere you want in your machine. So what we, I will do is I'll create a new folder here and I'll call it M1.2 for module 1.2 and select this folder. So I came to browse, selected my user. I actually create a new folder and call it that. Okay, actually didn't select it. Jeez. And I'm gonna give it the simulation a name. Uh, as I have already kind of spo spoiled, the simplest simulation is actually not biology, it's foams. Uh, the evolution of bubbles in a foam and how they behave. So give it a name, foam simulation or foam sim. Then we are presented with this next page, which sets up characteristics for the uh, simulation domain, how many pixels it has um, in three dimensions. If we, left, if we leave Z as one, it's gonna be 2D, which is what we want. Uh, we can leave these as the default. Uh, Python plus XML. And, um, in here, 
just which is the default. Um, Python only out would also work, but I find it harder to do some things. And what we'll do is we'll change the boundary conditions from no flux to periodic. Uh, the numbers here mean how many pixels each direction have. So we're going to have 256 pixels on X, 256 on Y. And since it's one dimensional, we only have one Z pixel. And the change here to periodic, what it means is with no flux, the edges of the simulation are walls. With periodic, they wrap around. So you, if you leave from one side of the simulation, you appear on the other side, which you can maybe see here with the old video game from the 70s of, or 80s, Asteroids, where the asteroids and the spaceship can leave the simulated domain in one side and they appear in the other, right? And since we are in 2D, uh, we just leave the Z as no flux. Uh, it shouldn't change anything in the behavior of the simulation, but don't quote me on that. Um, Okay, so, and there's one more thing that we're gonna change here. Uh, James mentioned that I did that CompuCell is pixel-based. Cells occupy a number of pixels. And CompuCell, the way CompuCell works is it tries to change the owners of each pixel. And it has a range to try, for which it tries to change those pixels. So this set to one means that it's range is one, so it's only, in here it's only gonna try, so here we have two cells, gray and white, and in, with range one, it will only try to change this pixel by the ones marked one here, so north, south, east, and west. With two, it's gonna do the diagonals as well. With three, it's gonna go two out um, in the straight line, and so on. We are going to change this to two for our foam simulation. And we're going to go to the next step. Which is defining our cell types. Almost everything in CompuCell is considered a cell. Even our non cells, which in this case are bubbles. So we need to add the bubble type to the cell types. And we just give it a name and hit add here. Um, and if you make a mistake, you can just clear the table and do it again. Uh, yes, it is creating a class, but don't worry about it. It's simplified. Um, so back from the beginning, give it a name, select the folder you want to save your simulation in, La leave the X and Y dimension and Z dimensions as is, so 256, 256, one change X and Y to be periodic and change the copy range to two. And now we add one cell type of bubble. And the next step, well, would be creating chemical fields if we were going to use any, we don't, we are not. So we can just skip this. Okay, so pixel order is this. 
So there is a gray cell here and a white cell. CompuCell selected this pixel to try to change the owner of it from gray to white. And the range tells us which pixels it can select to do the change attempt. With one, it's only gonna be north, south, east, west. With two, it's gonna be those four plus the diagonals. With three, it's gonna go, well, those eight points plus two, two steps north, two steps west, and so on. And four adds more of the diagonal and that balloons out. And that's also true for hexagonal lattices, which I'm not gonna use, but you can use hexagonal pixels in CompuCell. Oops. So the steps were name and place, uh, setting both of these to periodic, setting the range to two, setting a cell time for our bubbles, after all, we need them to exist. No chemical fields for this demo. And finally, we come into cell properties and behaviors. And the only one we need is contact. And this is why this is the simplest CompuCell simulation. We are only adding one restriction to our cells, which is they sense the contact with each other. And that's pretty much it. After we hit finish, uh, to edit, we'll, have, we'll generate all the files we need to, well, run the simulation. So, finish. So, popped up here on the left. Uh, we are not going to use any chemical fields, so just hit next on that page without adding anything. And we can double click here on the left and it's gonna open the three files that build our simulation. The two important files is the XML and the one that has steppables as part of its name. We are gonna spend 90% of our time during the whole week looking at steppables files. And for uh, plugins, I walk through again. So chemical fields leave empty, only one cell type. And cell properties, we only need contact here, which is the very first on the top left plugin, cell properties and behaviors. And that's, that's all. It's here as well. And that's all we need to run. We actually can right click here, the CC3D file on the left and hit open in player. And it's gonna open the simulation here. And so one bug with NanoHub that James mentioned is exactly this. We can see that the borders here on my player are not really, well, they are not aligned down here. So if I just wiggle this, it redraws everything. So, and one thing that we're gonna change on this XML 
is the initial layout of cells. So if I just hit step here and wiggle so that it resizes, the cells are in a square inside the square. Uh, we actually want the um, bubbles, not cells, to fill the whole of the pixel lattice. So here on the XML, uh, we have several options of things that we've defined already. Um, and we can change simulation properties here, like the size of the lattice. Uh, we can change those here. If we want to make it 3D, we just change Z here. We could define more cell types. Um, we have the contact energy in between cells. Uh, and we are not going to mess around with any of that. The only thing we are going to mess with is this final part, which is the uniform initializer. As you can guess from the name initializer, it initializes a group of cell in a region here. Right now it's going from pixel 51 to fix pixel 204 on X and same thing on Y. We actually want it to go from zero to 256 on X and Y. Uh, yes, yes. If you have a two, uh, one, two, two, eight size, you do one, two, eight. And uh, here we can also change the initial size of the cells. Uh, you may only be seeing black because if I let this run, the cells will disappear. Well, the bubbles will disappear. They are not cells. A uh, good question on Boxmin. I was wondering the same thing as I was typing here. I, I, I never remember if this is zero indexed or not, but there's a quick way to see it, which is just set zero and 256. And if CompuCell complains, we know that we did it wrong. And again, I have to wiggle, but it seemed to be happy with going from zero to 256. And another option with uh, the region here is that it allows us to set the initial size of the cells. Here they start with seven, but if I wanted to, I could put this to 20. And we can see that the cells are tiny squares there with size seven. But if I hit stop and tell it to start again, the cells are way bigger. And the simulation behaves like this because we only set the contact energy. We, computers are not dumb, but literal. We didn't tell CompuCell that the cells, well, that not cells we made should have a target volume, so they don't. But they have a contact energy, and CompuCell is trying to minimize the energy. So it's going to try to go to energy zero, which is nothing being present. And I could also, uh, but going back to cell size, I could go down to width two as well. And this is actually a better situation for this particular model to have as tiny bubbles as we can to start. And here we go. Uh, in this simulation, there is conservation of mass if we start with the whole of space occupied by bubbles. If we don't, there still is conservation of mass, but it's air bubbles being turned into medium, right? 
the blackness is medium. But yeah, here on the region, change from zero to 256 on X and Y and change the in initial width of our bubbles to two. You could also do one. It would also work if you want. And if you need to stop a simulation, here's the stop and play. And NanoHub is being really insistent with this rendering bug. And here we have our cell, our bubbles coarsening. Uh, is the whole player going black or the cell visualization going black? Huh. That is interesting with Twitter still working. I don't know, TJ? Uh, this might be an issue of needing to terminate the tool and then restarting it. Yeah. I've seen this a couple of times with a few. Um, yeah, there's uh, another reported issue. So if you have this issue, um, probably the most straightforward way to fix it would be to terminate the tool which you can see in the top right of Giuliano's screen and probably yours. Um, <clears throat> and then just restart the tool. Um, it should take you back to your main profile page, um, in which case on the right-hand side of the screen, yeah, in Giuliano's list of my tools, you should find the CompuCell main tool should be at, probably at the top of that list. And just relaunch, restart, and try again. Hopefully this... Uh, issue will resolve as we progress through the week. Yep. I don't know, it's probably easier if you select recent, then you'll see the one that you want. True, true. Yeah, if you launched CompuSell already, recent. Uh, and I recommend putting hearts on the tools that you want. That way it's going to be here on favorites as well. But back to here. Uh, as we can see, the bubbles got really big and some of them are still growing and some are shrinking so here is the first graph that we are going to do we are gonna plot the number of bubbles from this huge number to however many they are at the end and uh, what we can see here in the behavior is that some bubbles grow some shrink and this is a Non problem with a known solution that I'm not going to get into, but suffice to say that bubbles with many neighbors grow and bubbles with few neighbors shrink, and big bubbles get bigger and small bu bubbles get smaller. Sure, there is some thing to be said there. So we are going before we actually go to the creation of a plot. I'm going to make a small parenthesis. I've mentioned that we are going to spend most of the time. Um, if your bubbles disappear into you have nothing, you probably haven't set the region to be the whole of the simulation domain. But as I said, we are going to be looking at steppables most of the time. And I thought it would be interesting to do a quick rundown of them. Um, TJ went over classes yesterday, and we can see that this is a class. It has a init function, a start function, a step function, a finish, and a on stop. All of these are special functions for. CompuCell steppables, which are classes that inherit from this class. And init and start happen before time. So init um, 
happens even before start. We are not going to use it for much, although I will use it in this class. And start happens just before step zero. So we need to start our good places to set parameters. Say if I was in a simulation of cells growing by consuming nutrient, I could define the parameter for growth here in the start by having self growth rate equals to some number five. And then I could use the self growth rate here in step to make the cells grow somehow. This will be more apparent with other examples. Then the step, as the name suggests, happens every time step. And it's the series of commands that are going to be issued every time. And this is where we are going to prepare our data for plotting afterwards. And finally, finish, it's what happens after the final step. And on stop is what happens if you click stop here. Uh, they are very similar. Um, we usually use them to close data files that we ha may have been using um, and things like that. And what I usually do is from either one of these, I call the other. So inside of on stop, what I will do is I'll just type self.finish. This will call the finish function if I stop the simulation early. But this is just a parenthesis. Oh, yeah. And final thing, uh, you can have many more steppable classes. Uh, as we are going to see throughout the week in this class, to edit knows how. So in this case, we'd go to the CC3D Python menu, which has a bunch of submenus and commands, and click Add Steppable to add another steppable. Not going to do this now, but that's pretty much it. In this way, you could have a steppable that handles data, one steppable that handles one aspect of cell behavior, say one steppable for cell growth, one steppable for mitosis, one steppable for handling cell death, and so on. But again, for this lecture, we are only going to use one steppable in which we are going to do everything. So we are going to start by doing line plots. Here I have some examples. This is actually also a foam simulation, but instead of being dry, like here, it's actually wet. It has some liquid in between the bubbles there. And again, to add it knows how. So to add a plot, the first thing is we come to the start function. We place our cursor, cursor inside of it and make sure that the indentation level is correct. If we look here, we can see that there are there is this line and then here. This is two tab spaces. Then, to edit knows how, we come to CC3 Python, scientific plots, and setup, which is done in the start. And after we click that, scientific plots set up, we click that and to edit pasted a bunch of things here. Um, let me know if my font size is too small. Um, it's already going to be kind of hard to see things. So the nice thing about Python is that it 
cares about indentations if you're not inside a parenthesis. So here I'm just gonna remove all the spaces and put things in different lines since I'm inside a set of parentheses so that things are easier to see. So again, CC3D Python, scientific plots, setup, which should be in the start function. And it's gonna paste all of these. So this series of commands are, well, this first one adds a plot window on new one, and it assigns this name plot win for a plot win to it. It's titling this plot window with this string, and it's titling the axes and setting uh, X and Y to be either linear or log. And you can also set a grid on the plot to be there or not. And so this sets a plot window. These set inside that plot window, they add a plot series. In this case, we, this commands are adding two plot series. Maybe that's more easier to see. Um, so this is adding two plot series to the plot window. And it's calling one of them mvol and the other msur for volume and surface. And it's setting the style for the plot, what color it should be, the thickness of the lines or dots. And in our case, we are not caring right now about the volume of the bubbles, but the, so we can, and we are only gonna plot one plot series to this plot window. So first things first, I'm going to comment out the second one here by going to the beginning of the line and adding a pound or hash or quadruple plus whatever you want to call that symbol. And other things that I'm going to do is I'm going to change the title of the plot window to reflect what we are actually plotting. Um, so the title is going to be number of bubbles. Um, the X uh, title is going to keep uh, is going to stay Monte Carlo step since that's what we are doing. Uh, y axis, um, we can well probably change it to n or something, and we are going to change both x and y to be long, and we are going to activate the grid. So on the add plot window, changing the title, changing y axis title, both scales to be log and activating grid. I commented out the second command to add a plot series to the plot window. And the only thing I'm gonna change here is the title to be N as well. And Noah, we plan on posting the full chat log to uh, Slack afterwards. Yes. Uh, this uh, is on the start function here. Uh, and actually, 
to add a no sound, if we go to scientific plot, it says there start function. The setup should be in the start function. There are some other things that we're going to get to later that should be in the init function. But again, to edit will give a hint of where it should be. Spaces here. So if I hit run now, I make it redrawn. Ta-da. The plot window shows up. And here it becomes useful to come into window tile but as of now we are not actually plotting anything it's just the window is there and we can check that the window is there so the next step is to come into the step function which is where we are actually going to add the commands to pass data to our plot uh, by default, Compucell will have added this loop over the cells that exist, and it's going to print some stuff. We can leave that be for now. And before it, again, check the indentation level. Uh, we are going to come to CC3 Python, scientific plots, and add data points. And we can see that this one should be in the step function. So CC3 Python, scientific plots, add data points. And again, let me make things more visible by adding some new lines inside parentheses. As long as they are inside parentheses, all is good. And we are going to change these. So this is telling the plot window to add a data point. And the way it knows which plot series to add the data point to is by the time series title. Like here we have msur, which is one of the titles that was there, but we commented out. So in our case, again, we don't have msur. So commenting those commands out. You could also delete them if you wish. And we are not, we don't have a mvol series, we have a n series. So replace that by n. And we need to decide what, well, we are gonna plot the number of bubbles. We need to, that is gonna be here. Just gonna place that now there for now. Uh, we need to determine what the number is. And one final important thing actually is this MCS here. We are gonna keep the MCS there, but we've set the X scale to be log. And the first MCS is zero. So log of zero, it's going to be a problem. So what we do is instead of passing MCS, we do MCS plus one. Problem solved. And the way we determine this number of bubbles here, well, is by realizing we only have bubbles. And 
we have a list of cells, which is all bubbles. And for people that are familiar with Python or came to yesterday's bootcamp, you know that there is a quick and easy way to get the length of a list. And since the list is of all the bubbles we have, the length of the list is the number of bubbles we have. So instead of number of B here, we're gonna have length for the length of some list and the list we want is already present here. Ta-da. So again, for this part, we placed our cursor in the step, asked to edit how to do stuff, scientific plots at data point, commented out the second command, replaced the title to N, which is the title we used before, added one to MCS to avoid taking the log of zero, and we're getting the number of bubbles by getting the length of the cell list, which is the list of all bubbles. And now if we go back here, and hit play. There we go. And you know, um, there seems to be a bug in the most recent version of a comp cell that if we do log scales on the plot, it will print infs, infinities, where it's not infinity. But I assure you that even though the display is wrong, the data here is right. So you can see that there was a huge drop off at the start and then a slower drop off afterwards. And yeah, again, the infs are showing up on the MCS, which it shouldn't. Uh, yes, I tried using the shortcut to comment out lines here on Nanohub as well, and it's not working for me too. I think it's only a Nanohub bug. I think Nanohub sometimes has issues with um, keyboard commands because it doesn't know if you are doing it on your machine or if you are trying to do it inside this environment that NanoHub has. Um, so maybe this is too big of a drop to actually see anything useful. So what we could do, yep, we can do linear as well. Just changing, uh, the inf is a bug with the most recent version of CompuCell in log scale. So just change those logs to linear. And if we do it again, stop. We go. Yeah, so the inf bug is with log scale. Can you tile, hit tile there? Yep. If you can you show them the right click for uh, adjusting the, let's see if that works. And yeah, as James was mentioning, uh, we can right click the plot and where is it? Uh, there is a way to change the log from here. Y axis should work, see if it works. Try lake axis should be, no? Okay. Uh, here it's plot options transform, that's right. It's and yeah, it's grayed out for some reason. 
I'm not sure why. But in any case, putting that back to log, even in log scale, the change in magnitude was huge. So what we could do as well is, well, we can see that this drop is really at the start and afterwards it tapers off. After all, there aren't there are that many cells to disappear at this point as well. So what we could do is at some point during the simulation at a specific time step, say MCS 300, we could ask to edit how to erase what we've plotted, and that we will erase all the data um, in the plot and, well, start fresh. So what I've done there, here is uh, at time 300, MCS is the usual name for time step in cellular plots models. So at time 200, I'm clearing my plot and it's gonna, well, continue plotting from there. So now if I hit run again and wiggle, soon enough, we're gonna see that line disappear. and reappear. And now it's more well behaved. And we could actually try to fit a trend line and here in log scale, it would be somewhat linear, which is to be expect expected for foam bubbles. Um, well, uh, we did we didn't name the plot win to plot win. We named it self plot win. So, and here we have self plot win, but that should be what Reddit did by default. And how to erase all data? I've created this if by hand, which is just if MCS equals equals 300. Then I placed my cursor inside the if, and to edit knows how, oops, what is going on? Python, scientific plots, and erase plot. If we wanted to plot every 100 time steps, instead, it, you just do something similar with a if statement on the MCS, and if the MCS, well, you do something like if MCS modulo your frequency 100 is zero, oops, do this. But yeah, you can control time. Well, you can control when things happen by using the variable for time. Yep. And that's how you do line plots. Pretty easy. Does the hover over allow you to do the CSV save? later. MCS is time. And yeah, if I wanted to plot every 10 MCS, I do MC if MCS modulo 10 is zero and place this inside of that if.
yes, there is a way to get the number of neighbors, and uh, that is the exercise later. But it's it's real easy. It's going to be similar to getting the length of a list. It's not going to be the cell list, but still. Um, you don't have a colon after 300 there. So Python doesn't know what to do. And I mentioned that we can do, well, we've done a line plot. And the next thing we will do is a histogram in a few. Uh, do you have this before the add plot? So the way to do this is not by hand or copying what I'm doing, is asking to edit to do this. So cc 3 Python, scientific plots, setup for the start. And same idea here, cc 3 Python scientific plots at data points. And histograms are quite similar. You may have noticed that there are scientific plots here and then scientific plots histograms. And if you are finished, you could try to figure it out how to do the histograms already. It's almost the same. So the way to do this is to come back to the start function, uh, place your cursor anywhere um, after we've created this plot window. So after this commented out lines we have here, and again, ask to edit. cc 3 Python, scientific plot histograms, add a histogram plot. So again, cc 3 Python, on to edit, scientific plot histograms, add histogram plot. Let me make things more visible here. So in this uh, example code from Tweddit, as before, it was doing two line plots on the same plot window. And here it's making three histograms in the same plot window. Um, and in here, we are gonna have to change a few more things than we did before which, well, to start, we can't call it plotwin. We already used this handle for the plot window that we did before. So if we try to use the same handle, at the very least, some unwanted behavior will happen. So instead of plot window, let's, I don't know, change it to hist window for histogram window. And 
we also need to be careful that all of these three histograms that are going to be plotted on the window also need also need to reference the correct handle. So just you know replace plot uh, plot win here by hist win everywhere. So that's one thing. Um, the next thing is that for the example that I'm going to do, the X and Y titles are reversed. So I actually want X to be volume size in pixels. So I'm just gonna cut that string and paste it here. And then, oops, cut this string and paste it here. And finally, since we are we are only going to do one histogram, so I'm going to comment out the lines that create the second and third histograms. And again, to get started, it's uh, CC3 Python scientific plot histograms and a histogram plot. I'm going to carry on. And so as the titles of the axis um, spoil, we are going to histogram the cell volumes. We already have a, we already have the loop over cell list. So we only need to record those volumes into a separate list and then pass that list to the histogram. So here before the loop, I'm gonna create a list, call it poll list or whatever you want. And to create an empty list, it's this a set of open and closing brackets. And then inside of this loop, actually gonna comment out the sprint. We don't need it. And then I want to access the cell volume. And that one is easy to remember after all, cell volume. But if you don't, Twitter so knows how, CC3 Python, cell attributes, cell volume down here. Then what I'll do is instead of recording that to a variable, I'm gonna grab my list here and I'm gonna append to it this value. So we are li we're listing all of the cell volumes separately. And again, it's cell.volume, but for more complicated named things, uh, to edit knows how, CC to Python cell attributes. And finally, we only need to pass that over to the histogram. So same as we did with the line plot, we go to CCTV Python scientific plots histograms, add a histogram. So this would be a mistake because even though I place my cursor here on the correct indentation level, to edit insisted in putting the commands inside the loop. So this would not actually create the histogram we want. So I'm just gonna remove the extra indentation. And again, we only have one histogram in the plot. So I'm going to comment out the next two commands. And I'm going to make things more visible here. Uh, 
end, what the other thing that we need to do is okay, um, give me one moment. Sorry about that. My cat was about to drop a glass on the floor. Um, the other thing we need to do is use the correct handle. Right now it's using the handle plot win by default, which is not the plot window we want. We want, where is it? It's back on the start, hist win. So we just change plot win for hist win. And then the value array, it's not Gauss, whatever the example was doing, but volume list. And that's it. We are going to have a histogram now. So if I come back to here, hit stop and hit step and we go. A new window appears for the histogram. Uh, the values are being overwritten. So the whole of the step function is done every time step. So if you notice here, just before the loop over cells, I'm imping, I, I'm recreating the list as being empty or setting the whole of it to be an empty list. So it's drawing out the values from the previous time step before saving the new values. And now since I have another window, I'm going to go here and tile again. And we are going to notice that, well, this would be mod, uh, one thing that is more no noticeable with bigger cells is that they do start around the volume that you start them at, and then they going to have this more spread out distribution. And this is also a typical result for bubbles. Their distribution of volumes is a log normal. But that's besides the example. And one difference of the line plot and the histogram is that the line plot keeps adding points, and the histogram resets every time step. Now you know how to do histograms as well. Oh, I'm probably going to have to go over as well. Hi. OK, and the histogram is not scanning the cells. We are scanning the cells here. And we are getting their volumes, listing them all in this fall list. And then the only thing that the histogram knows about is this list and how many bins we want to have. So you could change the number of bins here as well. And the histogram will look a bit different. And one thing that was kind of mentioned during the class is that we can right click this plots and do stuff with them. In particular, export. So we can export them as a image file, png, tiff, jpeg. Uh, you can set the, the size of the image. And what the background color should be. Then you hit export and you select where you want to save it. So foam number. 
and hit save. And that crashed CompuCell for me. Nice. But if If it hadn't crashed, it would have saved the image. I promise you that. Um, and you can also save it as CSV there. And same deal, you click CSV, hit export, select where to save. Yeah, I, as soon as CompuCell loads again, I'm going to try to do it if CompuCell doesn't crash on me again. There we go. You run for a while. So export. And now I'm going to try to export it. Let's export a CSV data and export. Select a folder under my username and give it a name and hit save. And it didn't crash. And that's it for saving data. There's one final thing for this class, but I realize I only have two minutes. So I'm not sure if I should do it or not, but it would be the question of counting neighbors. Um, I think that's probably too much for now. Yep. Um, but that means we have to make sure that that's covered then in the next module. Well, I'm going to leave you with some homework then. Well, I'm going to show you how to count neighbors, and then I'm going to leave you with some homework. How's that? So the and way to can, do it. Sorry, Juliana, but while you're doing that, if people could fill out the module questionnaire while we're going ahead, that would be very helpful. Thank you. So one thing is we actually need a plugin to count the neighbors. So we need to go to the XML and place our cursor anywhere as long as it's not inside a opening and closing tag. And Twedit knows how. In this case, it's CC3D ML for XML. And we want a plugin called cell neighbors. Neighbor tracker here. So we need to add that. And to get the list of cell neighbors, we come here to the loop over cells and ask to edit how, since it's a Python visit, since we're visiting the neighbors, cell neighbors. And to actually count the neighbors, we'd only need to get the length of this here. So again, we need to add the neighbor tracker by coming to the XML outside any open and closing uh, tags. CC3DML, plugins, neighbor tracker. And in here, inside the loop of ourselves, we ask Twedit on how to visit their neighbors by going to the cc 3 Python menu and visit cell neighbors. And then the number of neighbors is the length of this list here. And you could add a histogram for the number of neighbors. You could add, which is part of the homework, you could add a histogram of the cell growth based on number of neighbors and so on.
that's all. Yes, the visiting neighbors is on the Python. So, CC3 Python is for Python. So we need, we actually do the visit in Python inside the cell loop. CC3 Python visit cell neighbors. But to actually be able to do this, we need to have the neighbor tracker plugin loaded up. And to load a plugin, that is on the XML. So in the XML, we go to outside, uh, anywhere outside uh, opening and closing tags and CC3 ML for XML, plugins, neighbor tracker. That's all for now. Yes, we will now break for lunch. I hope things went well and that you got something out of the lecture. Okay, would people who wanted to go into a breakout room for help, please, please send a message in the chat. And uh, Josh, if you can stick around, that would be great. And we'll put, help you help them for a bit. That's all right. Yep. Um, yeah, I'm here to help. Uh, the file uh, is on, um, the file I had you download is the final file. Um, and it is on the Google Drive that we shared as well. And we'll come back at 2.15 uh, Eastern Daylight Time, also known as in 25 minutes.
Hello, Julio. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, should we start or should we wait a few more minutes for allow people to have lunch and come back? I'd give them one more minute and please remind people about the record meeting being recorded. Okay, I think I will start the, the module 1.3. So I'm Julie Belmonte, I'm a former PhD student from James Glazier. And today I'll talk about uh, first a brief overview of how the cellar pots or uh, GGH, which stands for Glazier, Garnet and Hogweg uh, model, type of models work. I'll talk a little bit about epithelium and chemical transition and use that as an excuse for us to explore some functionality with the comp cell. I'd like to remember that this uh, class is being recorded and broadcasted live in YouTube where it will be available later for you to consult. I also make those, all those slides of the course available to you uh, by the end of the day uh, for that day and by the end of the course. You should all have access to this material. Remember, if you're having difficulties with uh, 
the exercise we are doing here, uh, please raise your hand or ask for help. Uh, someone will assign you to a breakout room and one of members of our team will help you with whatever difficulty you have. All right. So I will try to make this very interactive with you. I will ask you to type my uh, your answers in the chat. So I'll give an exercise and expect what will happen. Then please ask, uh, tell me in the chat what will happen. Then you try in the comp cell and see how if you got what you expect or not. All right. So uh, remember, these are the Zoom logistics. Okay. Feel free to go ask to go faster or to go slower as needed. Uh, and remember, it's not only me. It's, there's a whole team right now ready to help you whenever you have a, a difficulty during the course. Okay, so the outline of to this module will be, well, I'll give an intro to cell modeling, then a brief intro to comp cell, uh, cell or pots, GGH basics. We'll talk a little about the motivation and then we'll do step-by-step -step exercises, okay? So all the exercises can be done either in Nanohub or at your local computer, okay? So, so let's go to the question of how we represent a cell in a computer, okay? So, for example, here you have a figure of a cell where you see the, uh, I'm not sure if you can see my, my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Yes. Yes, okay. So here in red is labeled the membranes, in green is labeled the nuclei, and here is, this is an epithelial cell uh, tissue. And the question is how you can represent that in a computer to simulate those properties. So the very first kind of mo uh, models of cells, they used something called cellular automata, where basically each cell or entity is a pixel in a square lattice. It can be or hexagonal lattice. And then this pixel can either uh, disappear or appear again or move from one pixel to the next and that would be a very rough representation of cell movement okay another way to represent those same cells is by instead of being a point in a square lattice in a lattice they can be maybe a point uh, floating in space so this is called the particle models where each cell center is presented as a particle with some interacting potential where it's kind of rep uh, repulsive at the core. There's a, some preferred direction uh, or radius in this blue, and then there's a tail of interactions as you go around. But it, there's also maybe a cutoff of how far a cell can see another cell, or in this case, how far this dot here can see the other dot, okay? And another way that you can represent the cells is by using what's called vertex models where you're not modeling the cell center, but you're actually modeling the vertices between the cells. So for example, in this cell here, it has uh, six neighbors and uh, there is a vertex in these tricellular junctions and you model each one of those junctions as a point and there is a, some kind of interactive energy uh, or force relationship between those nodes that are connected by, and by each other and a set of nodes like this represents all the edges of the cell. Okay, so this is called a vertex model. Okay. And the other way that you can model a cell is by actually uh, representing a cell as a continuum uh, uh, material in, in a square lattice where each cell represents a set of pixels that make up the uh, their shape, uh, their volume. So here in this uh, picture here on the left, you can see a cell shape outline. If you zoom in, you see that the picture you're seeing is just a collection of pixels. So why not represent the cells in your computer as a collection of pixels, right? So here on the right, I'm just pixelizing uh, the same image, right? And, uh, and then I sign all the pixels that are on top of this cell here to say, okay, now this will be a cell that I will model. And then of course you can not only model one cell, but multiple cells. And here I'm showing just the outline 
of uh, to, or the boundary pinning of these other cells. Okay, so this is how you represent the cell in the cellar pots or glycer ganey hogwag model as a collection of pixels that represent its shape. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, so that is a static cell in our model. Okay, you have already seen this. But then how you evolve the cell. Okay, so here you have the cell. Now the way that the cell is gonna move and change shape is actually by flipping pixels. So now if I just play this movie, you see now the cell is alive. And what is happening is that the cell changes shape, changes format, and moves from one side to the other by actually flipping pixels around its surface. So this is called a pixel flip or pixel, or in other words, the cell undergoes a series of pixel copy attempts. So here you are seeing only the pixel copies that were, have been accepted, but there are also some pixel copies that were rejected by the, the model. And we go into detail about how this happens. Okay, so let's now look closely at how the pixel copy attempts work in the CPGGH models. So for example, here on the left, you have our cell, which has this specific shape. And at some point, uh, in the, in the, and as the simulation runs, uh, the way the algorithm works is that the computer randomly selects a pixel, uh, for example, this red pixel here. Once it selects this pixel, you're gonna try to grow this pixel to some pixel nearby. So this is what happens uh, here now. You, the cell, uh, the computer select the green pixel outside of it, and then you're gonna try to flip the green pixel to have the same identity as the flip the pixel on the in the red in the red. So the, you are trying to grow the cell by one pixel by doing this attempt. This pixel copy attempt will be accepted depending on whatever this drives the cell towards its target properties. For example, if the cell wants to grow, that will be accepted. However, if the cell in its current state wants to actually shrink, this pixel may still be accepted. This pixel copy is still be accepted, but with some probability. Okay. So so let's let's suppose that this pixel uh, uh, copy is accepted. Now the next thing the comp cell or the comp, uh, the comp cell three you're gonna do is gonna run select another pixel, which does not need to be a, a pixel that belongs to a cell. It can be a pixel that belongs to the space around the cell. For example, this red pixel here, and then again select some neighboring pixel. In this case, it will be this green one that actually belongs to the cell and try to copy what was, what is in this red pixel here into what is in this green pixel here. So in this case, it wants to actually destroy this pixel of the cell and change its shape. Again, the whatever this pixel copy is going to be accepted or not, depends on whatever this, this pixel flip will drive the cell towards its what it wants to do. So if the cell wants to shrink, because now it's too big after this pixel flip, maybe it wants to shrink, then this will be accepted. Or maybe the cell still wants to grow, okay? And in this case, this pixel flip uh, can, can still be accepted, with, but with some probability. Okay, so is this making sense so far? So, so now the question is, okay, so how do you specify what the cells want to do or what they do not want to do? All cells and objects in Copsal 3D have a set of properties and behaviors such as volume, surface area, length or their aspect ratio, contact interactions, as you saw before with the lecture from Giuliano, and directed movement and many others. We will be exploring many of them as we go along in this course. 
So each one of these properties and behaviors can be specified as an energy term in the total energy of the system. So the whole system that you're simulating can be described by a, uh, a set of uh, formulas that specify the energy of the whole, your whole system. So there is going to be an energy related to all the volume of the cells, an energy related to all the surface areas of the cell, an energy related to the length of the cells, to the contact of the cells, and so forth, so on and so forth. And do not worry about that now. We're going to go into each one of those energy terms in detail later. So, and what the comp cell is trying to do, or the CPM GGH model is trying to do, is try to minimize this uh, surface. So what happens in a spin flip opposite attempt is that given this kind of spin flip from this point to this point, this will drive a change in the total energy of your system. So here you have initial energy. And after, if you accept the spin flip, you will be driving your system to a new energy, HF, okay? And the way that you accept the spin flip is whatever this energy is being decreased or increased. If this energy is being decreased, the probability of accepting that pixel copy is one or a hundred percent. You always accept and you drive your system from here to here. If this pixel copy actually increases the energy of your system, okay, you can still accept the flip with some probability. And its probability is going to be proportional to how much this uh, or inverted proportion to how much this you're driving your system away from its target energy or away from, or in other words, away from the desired properties that the cells want to achieve, okay? So I, you write your energy terms in a, in a way that reflects what the cells want to do. And when your energy of the system is increasing, you're driving your system or your cells into a state where they do not really like Want, what, what they want to do. Okay, so if you're in, increasing the energy of the system, then there's a probability given by this exponential of accepting this energy, uh, this spin copy, set, copy attempt, uh, which will be proportional to how much you drive this, uh, this spin flip, uh, uh, you drive this energy up, or you drive your system away from its target properties. This is uh, you note that besides this change in energy, there is also this temperature uh, uh, parameter here, which is called the temperature or the noise level of your system, how much you allow those uh, undesired spin flips to happen, which can also be interpreted as the amount of membrane fluctuation that you allow your cells to have. Because all those pixel flips always happen at the boundary of the cell. You cannot have a, there is no point to have a pixel flip in inside the cell or completely outside is only when you actually change the shape of the cell that you this spin this copy attempts make sense which is uh, around the membrane of the cell so that's you can also call this parameter a membrane fluctuation amplitude okay so you try this this copy attempt and then if it's driving your uh, system towards its target uh, properties and behaviors you accept it is driving away you may accept a uh, some of them or not okay so in this case if it, uh, if it's driving about this much increasing energy then there's about nine eighty five percent of chance of rejecting and fifteen percent of chance of accepting so if it rejects you discard the copy attempt and try another one okay Okay, so because you are model, you want to minimize the surface of the, the energy of the system, you specify all those properties like the volume of the cell, the volume, the surface that the cell wants to have, and, and the length of the cell and other things like that, by writing all those energy terms as some kind of constraint or a, some kind of uh, hook and spring like potential. So, for example, all the uh, cells, they have a desired volume, okay? And this volume, and they have a target volume, which they would like to have. So, this energy term for a single cell is given by 
the difference between the actual volume of the cell given by this small v here and the target volume of the cell if this is equal to that this energy term then is zero and is already minimized if this the actual volume of the cell is not equal to the its desired volume or the volume that the cell wants to have then uh, you have now a non-zero uh, energy right which is given by this difference squared so it does not matter whatever the cell is below its desired volume or above its desired volume uh, what matters is this, this difference squared and then so this is how much deviation you have and this lambda volume here it, set, it sets the strength of this interaction so or basically the slope of this curve here so the bigger you have this string or this parameter here which is called lambda volume uh, the harder it is for the cell to deviate from its target volume it wants to be very close to it if you make this lambda volume very low then it, it accepts more fluctuations around its target volume and that's important you want to allow some fluctuation around the target volumes that being either the volume or the surface or have of some other property because you want to allow the cells to move a little bit okay so that's why you don't make this uh, super high you're gonna go into detail about this later on so any questions so far about how the pixel copies or how the cells actually evolve their shapes in Compcell? Or can we continue? Okay, okay, uh, I was not seeing the chat. What happens if they take higher order terms Hamiltonian, like equal to four, then you you uh well you are changing the shape of your curve right so you allow a little bit more uh well if a fourth order is going to be a little bit flatter at the bottom but it's going to go up higher later so you can there is a way to change those things in, in Copcell. you have to actually develop a new plugin uh, maybe by the end of the workshop, we're going to tell you how to actually change those terms. Why is the risk to take uh, harmonic terms in area and volume? That's a simpler way to that you can model this constraint. And you want to be either a uh, uh, two or four or six because you want to equal uh deviations either up or down to be equally penalized okay let me see if there's um more questions yeah so other things that uh, james luca point out is that those pixel copy attempts are done randomly okay there is no specific order that you do those pixel attempts if you make them to be order you add artifacts to the way your cells look okay so let's continue so i'll say that the one of the objectives of this uh, module here is to actually give you some um, intuition about how the things work in Compcell. okay so we will not do anything fancy on those next two modules we're gonna only go with the basics and explore the basics at length okay so we will not be doing anything in Python. You will only be doing simulation and look at the XML code. Okay, you go a little bit slow, but I will try to go very deep on how some very basic properties of the Compcell works. Okay, uh, because there is no point for you to learn all the bells and whistles that Compcell 3D can do if you do not know exactly what's going on inside Compcell. Okay, so to see. Uh, what I'm talking about I want you to observe those two Compcell simulations that I made okay and I want you I'll play one and then I'll play the other and I want you to tell me 
if there's anything wrong in one of those simulations. Okay, so please use the chat to say this. So let me play the first one. It's a cell moving and it wants to move along this diagonal. Ah, there's a good question there. I'm going to answer in a little. Okay. Okay, so we have the simulation of the cell moving. Okay. What do you think about this? Does it look right? Does it look wrong? Or you don't see anything wrong on this simulation? So let's see the other one. It's doing the same thing but differently. Okay. Now, which one do you think is more realistic? The one on the left or the one on the right? Left is better, right? Okay. Why the left is better? Maintain some integrity. Okay. Cells do not usually fall apart. They can break into parts. Uh, but not like that. Right? Okay, now let me... They are both conserving volume. Okay? They are... But the, 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 the right one's not integral, is, is, right? So there was a question about the, what's a Monte Carlo step if there's a pixel 10 per Monte Carlo step. No, a Monte Carlo step is defined as uh, a number of pixel copy attempts that's equal to the number of pixels in your simulation. Okay. So after you, so if here you have uh, this much pixels, right? I will not do the calculation right now. Once you do 250 times 250 copy of pixel attempts, that's the final one Monte Carlo step. So on average, you have to visit all the pixels in your lattice. And then you count this as one time step. Okay. Uh, it, it does not mean that those all those pixels have to be accepted. If 90% of them were rejected, that still counts as one Monte Carlo step. Okay. Okay. So now what made this cell look right and this cell look wrong? Okay. In terms of the parameters of your system, is that something that you hopefully know how to answer by the end of this workshop? Okay. So let me show now to another simulation, which actually involves many cells. Okay. Uh, I did many bad things for that, that simulation on the right, okay? Uh, so let me look now at different simulations which actually have lots of cells, okay? They are both self-sorting simulations where the green and the blue wants to sort out from themselves, okay? Uh, and you want, again, want to tell me which one looks right and which one looks wrong and why, okay? This one simulation. I didn't even play the right one. How do you know? Okay, so what's going on here? The cells are sorting, right? Okay, now let me play the right one. They are both doing the same thing, so the simulated process is exactly the same but they do not look quite the same at the same time, right? Okay, so both are similar self-sorting. In both of them, the green is on the outside and the blues looks go to the inside, okay? And both are happening more or less at the same uh, speed, okay? But which one you see that Okay, this simulation looks right, uh, looks correct, and this simulation looks incorrect. So, which one do you prefer? Do you prefer the one on the right or the one on the left? Okay, why do you say the left's better? Or, in other words, why do you say that the right is not good? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the blue cells have, have a very regular cell shapes. Actually, you can, I agree with that, and you cannot even tell where the cell starts and, and, and ends, right? Yes, it's excessive. What about the green cells on the right? Are they okay? Okay, James uh, just said that when the cells fall apart, you call it dust. Okay. They seem to be too rich, okay? The, look, compare the green cells on the right and the green cells on the left, okay? What's the main difference between them? They have a cubic shape, yes. Are real cells square? <laughs> okay, question. Can be, yes, I agree with Ajay. It can be sometimes, right? Uh, maybe those green cells are all right, okay? But usually not, okay? Uh, usually those cells, it, it, it some, under special circumstances, they look kind of cuboidal, right? So the cells can be cuboidal, okay? Indeed. Square watermelons, maybe, okay? Okay, so what I want you to the take message away message about those two examples is that even though you people can know how to use comp cell, there's even the simulation cannot look always a hundred percent correct. Okay, so I want you now in this 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 module and the next to develop the feeling of what are the parameters and how you can use them to make yourself to have the shape that you want okay uh, so you have control and you master how to use comp cell towards your purposes if your purpose was to have this kind of squarish cell for one of them you my objective is that you want you know exactly how all the options that you can use to actually have those cell shapes okay uh you i'll give no answer now uh, are you you're gonna now do the series of exercises and then you know by yourself how you can drive this okay 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 so let's continue oops okay okay so that's what we just discussed right uh, so to start learning about how this happens, we start by using a uh, trying to model something called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Okay, so that's actually a very hot topic of research and of modeling. Uh, and what I'll be doing here is I'm going to be a very poor man's model of epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Okay, uh, but to be getting there. But let me talk about first what 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 do I mean by the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, right? Well, these terms already assumes that there is an epithelial kind of state and a mesenchymal kind of state, and there is a transition between them, right? So you can classify the cells into two phenotypes, as epithelial cells or mesenchymal cells. Okay, so. This is a cartoon of a epithelial cell on the left and a mesenchymal cell on the right. And by just looking at this cartoon, you can already tell they, are, they, are, they look very different, right? The epithelial cells on the left looks like a cube, right? Looks a little bit cuboidal, okay? And the mesenchymal cells on the right, they look very... They don't really have a form, okay? And these cells on the left, the epithelial cells, what make the epithelium of your body, the... Uh, uh, the outer is the membranes of your organs and things like that and uh, biological barriers and the mesenchymal cells in a more proliferative state the cells that can move can walk and can go from one part of the body to the other okay so here is a another table which actually says everything the cartridge of an epithelial state and a mesenchymal state okay so epithelial state you can read that the cells are have a regular shape 
they have an apical basal polarization, so they have a top and a bottom. So a basal side that touches the ECM and a apical side that touches the an outer space. They have strong cell cell adhesions between the neighboring cells. They cannot move much. They have a set of typical markers. And the mesenchymal cells or the cells in a mesenchymal state, because cells do can transition between one state and the other. They are spindle shaped or very regular. They may have anterior posterior polarization, which is a polarization that's not along the height, but along the sides. So those cells can move, for example, and they can move in this direction. And then we say that they maybe have a, a front and a tail. They have strong migratory potentials, focal contacts, and there are a set of markers that you can stain your cells and see what, if they're in one state or the other, okay? What is apical basal uh, polarization? So, think of the cells that make the wall of your stomach, okay? They are epithelial cells because they made a kind of wall or an envelope of the inside of the stomach and the rest of your body. Uh, it's probably a lot of layers of epithelial cells, but let's say it's a single layer and all the cells all the surface cells that sees the inside of the stomach, that is the apical side, and the part of the cells that are actually connect to the neighboring cells is called the lateral side of the cell. And beneath those cells, there is a thick layer, usually a thick layer of ECM or extracellular matrix, which is made of many fibers and make kind of the floor. And the part of the cell that touches this floor uh, is called the basal side of the cell. So. Uh, in very rough terms, that is what it means, okay? Uh, if there's anyone that can can give a more uh, detailed answer, can jump ahead. But basically, that's what it means. Okay. <laughs> that was a good explanation, thank you. Uh, it's the best I could come up in, in the fly here. So, uh, as I said before, there's not a cell that's epithelial forever or mesenchymal forever, okay? You, the cells can actually switch states, okay, from one to the other, okay? So as, as the a body develops, right, or as you have a, some kind of disease, you can uh, switch from an epithelial to mesenchymal state or from mesenchymal state to epithelial state. And so there are many kind of transitions from one type to the other. So there is this transdifferentiation where an epithelial set of cells that have a specific function in the body goes to an intermediate state and then become another epithelial cell, okay? So this happens in development as the cells mature and form organs and tissues, uh, okay? But there's also epithelial to mesenchymal transitions. There is this type one, okay? So all this is taken from this source here where you have some kind of epithelial uh, 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 cell and those cells then become mesenchymal, okay? So they lose their shape and start to move and they go to uh, another part of the body and then they form another epithelium with this other part of the body. So that usually happens with, uh, for example, neurocrest cells do that during development. Uh, there is also sometimes that a cells will just become epithelial, a mesenchymal, and stay mesenchymal for the rest of their uh, life cycle, right? So that is the case when this, uh, for the fibroblasts. And there are also the case where things go wrong, where before you had a very well-behaved epithelium that was doing its function, and then those cells, for some reason, uh, do not know what they're doing anymore, and they become mesenchymal cells right, and start proliferating a lot. Usually they start proliferating a lot and then become mesenchymal, and then they migrate and form another tumor in another part of the body. So that is the reason why epithelial to mesenchymal transitions are so important, because that is what kills you when you have cancer, okay? So EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, is a hallmark of cancer, okay? The cells start to proliferate a lot, 
they usually lose their uh, mechanisms of contact inhibition. Usually when the cells are tightly packed, they stop proliferating, but cancer cells, they don't care, they just keep proliferating. And at some, and the more the cell proliferates, the more likely it's gonna is to receive different signals and uh, undergo more mutations. And one of these mutations may be make the cells become mesenchymal, they start to move, they can enter to a blood vessels and, met and the cancer can spread to other parts of her body. And the problem is that not all those cells spread, but they cannot then go the reverse process and become epithelial again. So that's called mesenchymal epithelial transition and form another solid tumor in another part of her body. Transformation is just when epithelial cell becomes another epithelial cell. So not all epithelials in our body are the same. So your skin epithelium is very different from the epithelial layer on your stomach, which is very different from the epithelial layer in your lung, and so on. It's basically when a cell changes phenotype, as Pedro said. Okay. But one thing that's important to uh, keep in mind is that it's not a binary switch. It's not like there is an epithelial state and then a mesenchymal state and you're either in one or the other, but the cells can split, it, it's more of a spectrum, it's a continuum. The cell can be very epithelial, a little bit less epithelial, something intermediate between an epithelial cell and a mesenchymal cell, or very mesenchymal, so that's, it, it's a, yeah, it's a gradation between those two states. So epithelial and mesenchymal cell types are more like uh, archetypes. Uh, the cells usually are in between those two cases, okay? And then if you want to know more, you can check those um, papers that I listed here. All right, so, and, okay, so this is something that we can make a very, very simple model in CompuCell uh, in the next hour, okay? Uh, is the transition, well, the, it can be. Yes, <laughs> I'm not the right person to say, but the cells can uh, display uh, very different levels of, in this spectrum from mesen pure mesenchymal and pure epithelium. Okay. Okay, so now what we'll do, we're gonna do some step-by-step -step exercises uh, in CompuCell, where we're gonna set up our simulation to kind of do this very simple model of mesenchymal epithelial transition. So the target is that you're gonna make a bunch of cells and want to make a, a, they are very tight together and we'll be seeing the cells from the top and then we're gonna change the comp cell parameters to make those cells kind of spread and become mesenchymal and spread around, okay? Okay, so, so this can be done either in NanoHub or in your own machine, all right? So, so the first thing I want you to do is to open tweet it and create a new CompuCell project, as you're doing here. Okay, can I proceed? I think uh, you should be familiar with this step now. Tweet is the, is the editor, is the name of the editor for Composite 3 d So it's the thing that you're, the uh, text editor that you're using in the previous model by Giuliano to actually uh, look at the code. No, no, you do not need that count. Uh, you should be able to get that from, uh... oh yeah, good. Uh, Tony, the pencil icon in CompuCell 3D should be able to uh, open it. So let me uh, go back. Where is this pencil icon? I'm trying to see if I have this. I don't think I have a screenshot of the player now. Here, 
if you have the player open and you click on this thing here, you should be able to open tweet it. Okay. This icon here. If you have your player open by clicking right here where I have my uh, my mouse, you should be able to open tweet it. Did everyone open tweet it? If you did say yes. <laughs> okay. So if you cannot Do you want to use the poll instead or Maybe I'll, I'll just go, go back now. Um, okay. Okay, so if you are on tweeting right now, let's click on Compsat 3D project and open a new Compsat 3D project. After you do that, you ask for the name of your simulation. Let's call it module one underscore three. Uh, and then underscore EMT. You don't need that other one there. And as you give the name for your CompuCell module uh, simulation or any kind of parameter that you want to have in CompuCell, you have to pay attention that you should not have spaces in your name. You should not have dots in your name. You should not have slashes in your name. And your name cannot start with a number, okay? Uh, otherwise, the console will get lost. You see the, if you see a space, you interpret that name as two different names. So please, no space on your name. No dots on your name. Otherwise, the console would think that is a function inside the class uh, and no slashes otherwise you will think that's inside the directory okay so please be careful when you name your things in Compsel. Right. so let's call this this name module one underscore three uh, okay no uh, basically everything that people ask you to add on your password don't add on your password <laughs> on here okay so no question mark, no exclamation mark, right? Only numbers and letters and maybe underscores, right? Okay, so give the name of simulation, make sure you have selected Python plus XML and then hit continue. Okay, now it will lead you to this other uh, window, okay? And just leave everything as it is. Okay, so it's going to be very simple. You don't have to do anything. Just leave those numbers exactly as you have in my screen now, and it should be okay. All right. Okay, let's continue. Hit continue. And now it's going to ask you for to add cell types. Okay. So, uh, so just come up with some kind of cell name. It can be Eptilium, or it can be my cell. It can be your name. Uh, but again, no dots, no exclamation points, no slashes, just uh, some, some kind of name. So here I just call my cell, right? But it could be anything. Okay. So you have to type here the name of your cell, and then you have to hit add. So it, when you hit this add, then this thing will populate the, the, the list. So make sure you have medium, which is the name of the black uh, background that you have in, your, in outcome cell simulations. And then you have your other cell type, which is called whatever name you, you gave. Okay. So type the name, hit add, make sure it's there. 
and hit continue later only hit continue when your cell is actually made into the list if you accidentally add more than one cell to the to your table you can hit this button clear the table and do it again boundary codings are, are no flux but if you add flux there is no problem okay uh, no no big deal So no flux, but if you want to add flux, it's okay. Okay, after you do this, we want to ignore the chemical fields. Okay. So just hit continue and proceed. And now you have one of the most important uh, uh, windows in this wizard. Okay, which you which asks you to select which kind of cell properties and behaviors you want your simulation to have all right so and in this case what you want is i want you want contact and want volume all right so please select contact here and select volume on on the middle one it's okay to leave the center of mass there okay actually any of those trackers is okay to have uh, but the more tracks you have, the, uh, it can slow down your simulation. So let's just have leave contact, volume, and center of mass. As Pedro say, said, you can change all this later. Okay, but it's much easier to do this here on the wizard. So after you do this, hit continue, and congratulations, your simulation is complete. Okay, our configuration is complete. So when you see this, you just hit done and that's it, all right? So you create a basic simulation, right? With some cells inside. Uh, before you enter into the code, let's just uh, play the simulation, see how, you, how it looks like. So please fill up the, the pool. To make sure everybody's on the same page. So if you need more time, I maybe I can go back and there's the list of all the steps you need to do. So there's uh, someone that needs help. Please uh, raise your hand, and we are and someone can help help you uh, either in the breakout room or by chat okay so what's the difference between volume flex and volume local flex is that the volume flex uh, sets a target volume a vo volume uh, properties for each cell type in a simulation but the volume flex can set a volume properties for each individual cell that's the difference. Okay, let's continue. So what you want to do now is just uh, let's just play the simulation, the player, and see what we have done, right? So once you have tweeted, you should see so the name of your thing here. So uh, okay, this is a old uh, screenshot where I used dots and <laughs> things went wrong. Uh, but you can either right click here and ask to open the player or you can directly just select this and hit the Compcell 3D icon and you open the simulation in the player. So please pl play simulation and tell me what you see. Okay, good, excellent. So, when you run the simulation in console, in, in the player, you should see something that looks like this. You start with a square uh, tissue with many cells that are very squarish looking like. And you should see that it kind of, the shape of the cells and the shape of the tissue itself relax over time. And after many Monte Carlo steps, or time has passed, it becomes rounder and rounder, okay? 
you're not seeing the graphic window for some reason, then try it. Uh, there's an icon there that you can open another type window, or you can look at the menu and hit tile, menu, window, tile, you should be able to rearrange all the windows in your player. A very long time step. If you don't get there, don't worry. Okay? But you should get from here to here very quickly. Right? Yes? Okay. Okay. So eventually you get something like this. Okay? Uh, we will get there. Okay. So here I have all my cells kind of this orange. And I do not know which color the cell you have. So, uh, if you don't like the color of your cell, you can change it. So in the player, there's this icon that James Glazer already referred to, which is, uh, have these tools here, you click there, and there's this all the steps. You can select the color, cell colors tab. There's the, all your cells with all the colors they have. You can just click on the color and choose a color for one of those uh, color options here. Okay, click then, okay, hit okay again, and your cell will have your desired color. You can also specify the boundary color, the background color, uh, even the medium color. You want, if you want it, instead of being black, being white, or being gray, you can, you can customize your simulation to be whatever color scheme you want. Okay? So, so let's now talk about what's going on in the simulation, right? So two things are going on in the simulation. First, in a very short term, what you see is that the cells initially are all squarish and the tissue itself is very squarish. And the first thing that happens is that the cells that are initially very squarish now relax their shapes become a little bit more round, okay? So the cells quickly lose their shapes, okay? In the long term, if you keep playing simulation for a very long time, you see that the whole tissue itself rounds up, okay? And becomes, initially it was a square, and then the end's gonna be more rounded like you see here. So those two effects happen in our simulations because of the contact, uh, uh, term that you select in the wizard, okay? So, and the other thing that you may notice is that the cells do not grow or shrink. So in the previous module, when you did the cell foam, I mean, the foam coarsening uh, simulation, uh, some bubbles grew, grew and some bubbles shrink. That happened because in that simulation, you did not have volume constraint. Here, each one of those little entities that you call here the, our cells, they have a volume constraint, so they can change their shape, but on average, they keep their volume the same. So that's why there is no cell disappearance here. Okay. Okay. So, so this rounding of the cells and the round of the tissue are both downstream effects of the contact energy that the cells have with their surroundings, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about contact energies. We're gonna talk twice about it today. First, I'm gonna give a brief review and then I'm gonna go more in deep in module 1.4. So this is a brief hint of the contact energy. So, well, what the contact energy does is specify which cells, which other objects the cell likes to touch or to be in contact with, and which other uh, cell, other objects in simulation the cell does not like to be in contact with. Okay, and this how much it likes or dislikes other objects around it that is touching that it is touching with its surface depends on whatever contact energy values you give for that cell and these other objects, okay? So if your simulation has three types of objects, A, B, C, or three types of uh, cells, including the medium as a type of cell, there is some kind of contact matrix that specify 
that have a value for each one of those type of interaction. Okay, so in the case where you have three cell types, these are all the relevant uh, contact energies that you can assign or set in your simulation. So there will be an energy between cell of type A with another cell type A, alpha B with a B, and a C with a C. So these are the diagonal values in this matrix. And there's the contact energies of a cell in a different object. So for example, from cell A to cell B, from cell A to cell C, from cell type B to cell type C. So A, B, C are cell types, okay? So, so the way it works is that if every time you have a, spin, a pixel copy, right, the cell changes its surface, right, and now become increases contact area with some cell and decreases contact area with other cell types. And what happens is that once you attempt this uh, pixel copy, comp cell, we're gonna look how much increase in area you have with, with uh, this cell has with other cell types and determines, okay, am I increasing the air with the cells that are the objects that I like and decreasing the air with the cells that I do not like? If it's so, it accepts, and if not, accepts for probability. So the way this works, sorry, uh, is that the cell, there's an energy term which you look at the cell, uh, the pixel that is being flipped. So for example, if this is a cell outline in gray here, and this pixel is being flipped, okay, what this energy term here is look at all the other pixels around it and calculate this uh, and sum this energy term between this pixel, the cell type of this pixel, and the, oops, the cell types of all the pixels around. Okay, so roughly that is what it's doing. And uh, and that is done for all the pixels around in the sur surface of the cell. Okay, but what you really need to understand here is that there's going to be a additional contact energy between each pairwise possible pairwise interaction between the cell types in your simulation. Okay, and one the other thing that is important is that okay, yeah, Pedro just said that. The matrix is symmetric, David. Yes. So the energy between cell A and B is the same as the energy between cell B and cell A. So that's why I did not show these terms here because they are redundant. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question. Okay. So the higher you make this J, the less uh, likely is this interaction. So this interaction will be penalized. The lower you make this J, or the lower energy you have between two cell pair interactions, the more favorable that interaction it is. And then you favor all those pixel copy attempts that increase the area of contact between cell, that cell and the other cell. Okay? We will go in practice how this works. And then you will develop the intuition how these things have, uh, work in practice. Okay. Ah, very good question. They are all relative. We're gonna go into this in one of our exercises. Okay. So, in, um, H con yes, is global. Uh, but uh, the actual values of those those J's. Uh, if you scale all of them by the same factor and all other uh, energy term by the same factor, you should get the same result. Okay, so let's continue. Oops. So, in our simulation, the one that you just run, okay, you just have two cell types. Okay, you have the medium, and you have the your, the cell type, which whatever name you gave. Okay, suppose it is my cell. You, you just use the same uh, name that I gave. So in this case, you have just 
three contact energies between medium and medium, between my cell and medium, and between my cell and my cell. So between the cells and between cells and medium. The contact between medium and medium, or the background and the background, does not matter because you just have one background. So this this J here is uh, irrelevant. So in this simulation that you just created with just one cell type embedded in the medium, there's only two contact energies that are relevant, which is between the cells and between the cells and the medium. So it's a very simple simulation. And by default, all those uh, J values are given assigned the value of 10. Okay, so that's the default values that the CompCell 3D wizard gives to you. Okay, so you just have two parameters in your simulation the contact energies between the cells and the contact energy between the cells and the medium. All right. Okay, so, so now let's start to do something to your simulations, okay? So let's start by uh, increasing the energy between the medium and the cells, or the J medium and my cell. So currently, that value is 10. Let's make it 20 and see what happens, okay? So uh, you can already do that and see what happens, but let me explain you first the two ways that you can do it, okay? The first way you can do it from the code, okay? So you can go back to the tweet it. Oops. You can double click on this module 131 here and open this list of all the files used to set up your simulation, okay? okay. Then I want you to select the XML Click on, double click on the XML or just select here from this tab. Then you should see in the XML code where you actually, all those plugins and extensions are called, okay? Next, uh, I want you to go to the contact plugin, which should be around line 36 in your code, okay? And here you see all those three values that I just talked about and Let's now change, oops, online, should be around line 10 now, which is the energy between the medium and my cell. It used to be 10, I want you to make it 20, okay? And once you do that, you change the value, save the simulation, the code, and then go to the player and, and play it. To save your change, you can just hit this, uh, disk here which will save your simulation or you can click on the file save or hit ctrl s if you are on a mac on a windows machine sorry or command plus s if you're on the mac okay once you save your simulation you see that this icon here was red and turns into blue okay after you save simulation you can go to the player and play the simulation again so that's one way to do it. So you go to the code, change this, the, the value there, save, go to the player and hit play. You probably have to hit stop to stop the simulation that you were doing before and then hit play again, okay? But there's another way that you can actually change the uh, parameters of your simulation. You can change them while the simulation is running, okay? So that's the second way to do it. You can change in the player. So with the player running, you see that you have this window there on the left called model editor, okay? So my suggestion is to pause the simulation. So hit this button with the choose uh, vertical bars, right? And then, then you look at the model editor and you see that there's a a column called properties and a column called values, right? You can open here and see what's the values that you're using that current simulation. Uh, 
Navy, you ask a very good question. We can discuss that later. Okay. Uh, so, so how, let me go back to how to change the uh, parameters in the player. You can, in the mod editor, click on the plugin next to contacts, and that's gonna open. Uh, you show all those energy that you're using in your simulation. You can then click on each of those energy terms and expand, saying, okay, this is the energy between medium, 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 myself, myself, myself. And you can directly change the value of the contact energy right there. So you can go there and change from 10.0 to 20.0, okay, and see what happens. The only catch is that if the number has a decimal uh, point, the new number must have a decimal point. If the number before was an integer, the new number you have to put there has to be an integer, otherwise it will not work. That's the only catch. The other catch is that the nice thing about this is that once you change the value, you see the effects right there in front of you, and you can change the value as much as you want while the simulation is running. Uh, but the problem is that once simulation runs out or once you hit stop and you and then you play again, the simulation is gonna go back to the values that were on the XML. Okay. So that's the downside of changing the player. Okay. But anyway, uh, you can do that in the player. You don't need to pause and play, you can actually do it while it's playing. Uh, but in any case, with other methods, you should see something that looks like uh, this. Do you all get something that looks more like this? Uh, yes or no? You can. Yes. What happens if to zero? That's a good question. You can do that later. Okay, so did all of you got this? Now, how you open the window to change the parameters? I can go back very quickly. Oops. Uh, in the in the player or in the tweeted? In the player should be the model editor. Okay. And then you can just click here on the plugin and uh, keep opening it on these arrows here to open the value and then you can change the, the thing right there. The play this you should have this window called model editor to the left. Okay. Uh, if you need more help, you can uh, raise your hand and someone of our team will help you. Got it? Okay. So you got this, okay? So, so you, you got something and then let's first discuss what happened, okay? What happened is that before you have simulation that looks more or less like this, and now you have a simulation with this new value where the cells looks like this. So it's a little bit different than before, okay? The tissue surface is much smoother and you can also see that the uh, the tissue rounds much faster, okay? Right? So why this happens? This happens because the cellar pots or DJ model works by minimizing the energy, okay? When you set this J to be high, now the cells have a higher energy with the surrounding. So the way to minimize this energy is to make that surface more smooth, okay? So it make it before here, you can see that it was rough, right? Uh, you can up, lots of ups and downs, right? You can see the contour of the cell, look from the outside. And now in this simulation, because we make the energy bigger 
and you want to minimize the energy, it looks like a straight line. Okay. 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 So, and because also, also the J is higher, you more quickly accept those spin flips that uh, minimize the surface and you reject more the spin flips that deviate from this surface minimization. So the surface got smoother and got smoother faster because you increase the energy contact between the cells in the medium. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay. I hope it does. <laughs> okay. So now okay i know that james asked you to do negative <laughs> but before we do that you can do that if you're more advanced of course but uh, here i'm doing a step by step okay so we increase the energy from 10 to 5 okay no from 10 to 20. now let's decrease from 10 to 5. okay so now let's have a lower addition energy between the cells and the medium what do you expect to happen and why does this happen? Can anyone tell me the answer before doing the simulation? You can also unmute yourself and tell, and tell, tell us. I would assume that the cells uh, change much faster and they get looser in some sense. Okay, good question. Does anyone agree or disagree with him? Surface will be rough, okay. Maybe take longer to round out, or maybe it does not round at all. Okay. I guess I would expect so when we increased it to 20, it formed a, like a circular shape, and I would expect it to basically do the opposite where it yes. kind of spreads out more when we have five. Okay. Good question. Okay. So let's try the simulation and see what happens. And let's see if the simulation outcome confirms all these expectations. Have everyone done the exercise? Please fill up the pool, and then I can proceed with the the answer. So, if anyone needs help, again, raise your hand. And someone from our team will come and help you. All right. Okay, I think I can uh, proceed. So you should get something that looks more or less like this. Okay. So who got something that looks like this? Say yes, I got it. Yes, yes, yes. So, is this what you expected by lowering the additional energy between the cells and the medium? Yes, that's what you expected, right? So it becomes much rougher, right? Because now the cells actually have a slightly preference to be in contact with the medium than if being in contact with themselves. But they still like to be in contact with themselves, right? So what happens is that the surface becomes much rougher, okay? Some cells even detach, as you see those three ones here. But this mainly is a, is a, it's still a cohesive uh, uh, tissue, right? So you can think of this as seeing a bunch of cells in a, a Petri dish and you look at the microscope from the top, right? So, so, so one thing that I want to bring your attention is that in the simulation that you did with additional energy 20 and the simulation 
which you did with additional energy five, that additional energy was between the cells and the medium. And the energy between the cells themselves, you didn't touch, right? So if you look at the core of your cells, you see that there is no difference between the cell shapes inside the tissue. Did you notice that? Okay. So here, if you look at here inside the cells and here, and maybe if I just show you those two small squares here, you cannot tell from which simulation they are. Okay. And I guess this make this makes sense because the interaction between the cells and other cells is given by a parameter that can, did not change between simulations. Okay. Do you agree this makes sense? The answer for far which question is yes. Still belong in the same cell. So you only change the digital between the cells and the medium. So only the region affected was the surface of the tissue. Inside, it stays exactly as before. Okay. So now, okay, I know that many of you have already done this, but try to decrease the contact energy between medium and my cells even further to values lower than five. You can try three, for example. What do you expect to happen and why does this happen? Okay. You can type in the chat what you expect it, it to happen. Try to, try to think about what you expect before you actually run simulation. They will detach, dissociate themselves even more, spreading away. Good chance for job. Even higher preference for medium contact, so the cells break up. Oh, okay, EMT, yes. Let's check. So you should see something that looks more or less like what I have here on my screen. Uh, so at the beginning, you see a lot of cells detaching here, and at so much progress, they detach more and more and more, and eventually you have the spreading of all the cells uh, in the medium. Okay, oops. So do you all got something that looks like this? Yes, excellent. Okay. If you got something that looks completely different on from this, then please raise your hand and someone will help you. So what's going on here is now that the cells really like the medium and want much more than they like themselves. Like so they say just buy to your neighbors and go to the medium, right? Uh, it's not that the cells dislike the other cells, it's that they now they much prefer to be in contact with the medium the other cells and that happened because I lowered the additional energy so much of the cell in the medium that the cells break apart and spread and this will be maybe an equivalent way of losing the contact between the cells or you can interpret this as uh, a very simple model of EMT transition where the tissue was very compact first and then they just lose their contacts and spread around and move randomly. So it's equivalent to a epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Okay. Okay, so does this make sense? It does, okay. So the other thing that we can do is we just play with one parameter, right? We can now play, there is another one, which is the digit between the cells themselves, right? So 
how about we start to explore this one now okay so uh, Oops. Send a message to wrong person. Okay. So let's now go back to the simulation and first set back my cell and medium energy to be 10. Okay, back to those value. And let's decrease now the values between cells from 10 to 1 and run simulation. Okay. So if you lower, you keep the addition uh, energy between cells and medium to be 10. And I'll decrease the addition energy between cells. What do you expect to happen and why? Please write in the chat what you expect and then go and do the simulation. So the idea here is to set the energy of the cell medium back to 10 and now decrease the value energy of between cells from 10 to 1. So now your decrease energy between the cells. What do you expect to happen? Okay. Do the cells now like to be with themselves more or less than before? More, right? So if they like themselves more, what 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 what, what should they do? They stick together more. How does it that translate into cell shapes? Yeah, firm is very good answer. Yes. What will happen is uh, on the outside you still round the tissue, right? But inside the cells look very regular, right? Okay. And now you can already guess what I did to that cell sorting uh, simulation that I showed at the beginning, right? So because they like so much to be in contact with each other. They want to maximize the contact with each other. So they start to hug each other, right, and they form their shape, and then it becomes very regular as you see here. Okay, so this is what happens. What you may also notice, and you have to play the simulation again, is that the tissue itself rounds up much faster than before. Okay, why does that happen? Did you notice that the tissue rounds up faster? Who noticed that? Okay. okay, but it's not okay. So that's that's interesting. Okay, we did not change the contact between the cells and the medium, right? Yet you see some effect on the, that surface. Okay, what happens is that because the cells like so much each other, they want to. Uh, increase the surface with one another so they become very regular another effect down since that is that pixel uh, copy attempts that change the cell shapes inside the cell are more easily accepted so by decreasing this value from 10 to 1 okay for the energy of the cells you also made the cells more fluid like so they can change their shape more easily not only the shape become regular but it becomes very motile Okay, they become very, uh, there are a lot of fluctuations. So the cells can be deformed from the outside much easier than before. Okay, so because they can be deformed much more easily, this allows the surface tension from the cells through the medium to actually uh, exert this effect more readily than before. Okay, so that's why the outside of the tissue also rounds up faster. And more than before because the cells inside are more fluid like and before the cells were more like glassy like okay so this is written here in text at the end 
Does this make sense? Tony, want to say something? No? Okay, so now I'm going to proceed to the last exercise of the of the module, okay? Um, yes, there is a way to constrain the surface area, yes, okay? I'm going to go over that in the next module. So everybody, is everyone done with this? Okay, so, okay, let me try to explain in another way. The contact energy between cell and medium is still there. Okay, it's still 10, it's still high. So that, uh, it's still so, a relative high value so the tissue still wants still wants to minimize its surface to the medium, right? What happened is that before the cells are, were did not very, like to change their shape very much, so it was harder for to for the cells to move relative to one another, and it was hard for you to deform the cell. So this minimization of energy uh, before was kind of hard to achieve. You could force it by just setting it higher. And that's what you have happen when you set the J between cell and medium from 10 to 20. From here, uh, in this simulation, you make those cells inside the tissue to be much more fluid-like, much more deformable, which means that you actually facilitate the process of smoothing the surface from the outside. The effect was there before. You still want to minimize the surface of the tissue with a J between cell and medium equals 10. But now it's much easier because the cells inside are more fluid. So you see this secondary effect happening. So it's not only what, what really matters is that uh, before you have a, both energies were 10 and now one energy is still 10, but the other is one. So you, be, you made that process that happened at the boundary to be much more easily achievable because it's much higher than what you have in, inside. You actually did a, a similar thing before when you keep the energy of the cells to be 10 and increase the cells and the medium to be 20. You are, What you did, you make this outer process of rounding much stronger than the internal process of not being deformable. So you could do it. So what, one thing that matters is not the absolute value of the parameter, but the value of the parameter compared to the value of the other parameters. That's what matters. Does it make sense? Okay, actually, that's actually what it's on my next slide. In our simulation, what really determines the resulting behavior is not the absolute value of the contact energies, but the relative values. Okay. Uh, so, so I still have ten minutes more of my class material to go. It's everybody okay if we go over a little bit. Yes, okay. So let's try uh, this, this new set of simulations. Let's make both the J between medium cells equals to one. So the cells really like the medium, so you should fragment the tissue. And then let's also make the J between cells and cells to be one. So the cells really like each other. Okay, so now we have two effects kind of competing, right? Uh, what do you expect to happen? Okay, so make both the J medium myself and J cell myself equals to one and see what happens. But before you do that, please type in the chat what do you expect to happen.
will the tissue fragment or will the tissue remain cohesive? Okay, so let's run simulation, see what, what, what comes out. some good answers in the chat did you run some okay you're getting right yes so let's run simulation see what happens make both additional energies to be one okay. oh sorry so basically that's what happens so it's what uh they remain together because uh, they want to be uh, in contact with each other, but but they also become very rough. So it becomes rough all around. Okay, so the contact between the cells and the meat becomes very rough, and the contact between the cells themselves becomes very rough. Okay. So, oops, the first effect would lead to tissue fragmentation, but the second uh, parameter. J myself equals to one prevents that from happening. Uh, good question, Kato. I do not know. I think it's the same as before. Okay, when both were ten. Okay, so does this result make sense? Do you all get it? So, so now I have a question for you. In those two simulations, both addition values were the same. In the, on the left, they both were equal to each other and equals to one, and on the right, they're both equal to each other and equals to 10, okay? So why this, is the output different between the two? Why in one is they are very rough and the other is not rough? Can anyone, does anyone know the answer? I would like to answer in the chat. They're both trying to do the same thing by the same amount of degree. So why in the first one, uh, why, why, why they, they don't cancel each other? Is there another parameter that should be important? Ah, good answer, uh, Job. The chance for pixel flip will be accepted uh, higher. On which one? On the left or on the right? On the left, yes. So you're already right hitting on what the this third parameter. What matters not only the relative values between the parameters, but also the relative values of those parameters to the absolute level of noise that you allow in your system or the, the temperature parameter. Okay. So so remember that the pixel copies depends on whatever how far you drive your system away from the its uh, energy minimization so when you have the original simulation with both values equals to 10 you are driving this kind of how much uh, fluctuations energy when you make those uh, much lower you're driving like here so one way to scale this uh, uh, thing is by changing the temperature of their simulation to 10 okay and when you do this you should now have exact the same uh things that you had before okay 
So the default value of the temperature in your constant simulations is also 10, okay? So, yeah, the default is 10. So why don't you go back to the simulation that you have before with both additional energies equals to 1, and let's make now the temperature to be equal to 10. Okay, so let's try to do this set simulations, make this equals to 1 and this equals to 1, and compare to the simulation that you had at the very beginning, which were those 2 equals to 10 and temperature equals to 10. Do you get the same result? Do you expect to get the same result now or not? Where do you find the temperature? Uh, good question. That should be... Um, that sh I didn't show, no, right? That should be on line 16. So if you look at the code, it should be uh, on here is the temperature of your simulation. Okay, it's, it should be inside the pots uh, uh, section of the XML. Okay, that's where you can change temperature. And then what I want to do is make this equals to one, and those two energies here at the bottom equal to one as well. Right. So well, the answer is that both simulations should look now exactly the same. You revert back to what you had at the beginning because what matters is not first the relative values of the parameters with themselves matter, but also what it also matters the relative values with respect to the temperature of your system. Okay. Okay. So Okay, very quickly, uh, uh, in exercise 1.33, we set our parameters to this, right, remember? And we fragment the tissue. We can also get the fragmentation of the tissue by changing the addition between the cells, okay? So if you, how, if you want to achieve the tissue fragmentation by increasing the energy between the cells, change the energy between the cells, do you should, do you, uh, should you make the, this energy bigger or smaller? Okay. So you have to make them bigger, so the cells do not like to touch each other, right? So, and you, you can try to do this. So this is the very last exercise that with the, of this module. You can fragment the tissue by two ways, by first decreasing the contact energy between cells and medium, or increase the contact energy, energy between the cells. Okay, to try this, try to those two set simulations. The first one is what we just tried before, right? Decreasing the addition between medium and cell. But now I want you to try this other one, which where you keep this addition between medium and cell to be 10, and now increase the energy between the cells, and that should also lead to tissue fragmentation, okay? But do you expect exactly the same outcomes or not? So because we're already running out of, we're already over time actually, I'll just show the results and 
In both cases, you have the fragmentation of the tissue, right? But the cells look different. Okay? So, in the first method, the cells fragment, but they look very loose. Okay? In the second method, when you just increase energy between the cells, so the cells do not like each other, they also fragment, but they look very round. Okay? So, this happens because in the first method, the cells want to be in contact with the medium, right? So, they become a very rough surface to maximize the contact with the medium. In the second method, it's not that the cells like the medium, it's that the cells really dislike each other. So, they just detach from the tissue, and but they still want to minimize their surface, so they still become very round around themselves, okay? Does this so in both cases are fragmented tissue, but from kind of different ways to achieving this? Okay, so if you want to model EMT, which method of fragmenting the cells uh, you would you choose? Would you choose the one on the left, or would you choose the one on the right? Okay, left. Okay, why the left? Some will choose the one on the right, some will choose the one on the left. Uh, well, on the right, the cells detach, but they still like kind of very round. They do not look that like those mesenchymal cells that you saw at the beginning, right? But the ones on the left, they look more regular, they look more mesenchymal, okay? So, so maybe the left one is better, okay? So you see that there are many ways that you can achieve the same results by depending on how you change the parameters, okay? And as you do more and more exercises, you get a sense of how the are you get a sense of do my cells look right? Do my cells look correct or not? Is the outcome that I want? And uh, oh, now it actually depends on the context. So I just said that. When individual neurons eliminate, they do it more like in the right. So maybe for that specific process, you want to do this in, in that way. Okay. All right. So if this is actually the end of this module, I know that I went over time. Uh, but I thank you for your patience. Let's stop here and give a 15 minute break. Right. And then come back and you're going to actually now talk more about all the different ways you can actually change the cell shapes. Okay. Okay. Please uh, remember to fill out the end of module questionnaire. Uh, so we have your feedback, please. Okay. So please fill up the end of the module and it'll be back, back in uh, 15 minutes. Okay. So let's see. 16, uh, 20, we'll be back, all right? Okay, I hope you enjoyed and thank you for your um, attention.
Okay, before we get started again, I'd ask people to uh, fill out the little poll that's up on your prior experience of network modeling. You might have called this ODE modeling. If you come from a particular background, you might think of it as epidemiological modeling or population dynamics modeling. Um, some people took Herbert's course two weeks ago, I know. Uh, some people may have done it using other platforms. Uh, we will cover the basics in class, uh, but we know by knowing how many people have had prior experience, we can adjust our materials a little bit, uh, the amount we cover. So please do fill that out for us uh, so we can adjust appropriately. And uh, we've also posted again, the uh, a link for the hackathon uh, Google Doc and a link for uploading hackathon slides if you'd like, remember that uh, you don't have to uh, post in the hackathon slides and text to participate in the hackathon. If you come up with an idea later in the week, that's fine too. If you want to talk to us about ideas, that's also fine. Uh, it's just uh, to give you an opportunity to recruit a team. And uh, I noticed uh, looking at the hackathon slide deck, uh, if you're not using PowerPoint for your slides, please upload them as a PDF uh, so that they're easier to aggregate. Um, we'll do our best to, to read uh, unusual file formats, but uh, uh, they're going to be presented as a PowerPoint, so it's easier if everybody's slides are PowerPoint or PDF to begin with. Appreciate your patience on that. Julio, are you back, ready to, to take over? Yes, I am. Uh, give me one minute to up, up the slide. All right, hello everybody again. Uh, so on this module 1.4, we will now talk about all these other plug-in energy terms that actually influence the shape of the cells. Okay. So again, zoom logistics, uh, you can, you never use, but you can, you are free to use these buttons of yes, no, go slower or go faster okay if you please use the chat to answer my questions and say yes no makes sense does not make sense if you need help let us know and some of the person on the team we can come and help you okay so we all be doing all those pools as you go along to know uh, if you can proceed uh, in the exercises and everything is going to be made available to you by the end of the course. I know that you have an incomplete set of slides from the previous module on the student materials. I will upload the complete one as soon as this uh, is done, okay? I promise. So, in this module 1.4, I'm going to give a motivation, which is uh, cell shapes, and then we do the step-by-step -step exercises in the same format as we did before. Okay, so the motivation here is very simple. Cells are not, do not look alike. The cells have very different shapes. Okay, so here is a C, uh, um, it, they can vary a lot. The size is very a lot, the shape varies a lot because each cell is doing a very different function. Okay, so, uh, so these are brief review of all different cell shapes and before we talk about epithelial cells and mesenchymal cells we kind of said that all the epithelial cells look like cubes that's not 
actually true. The epithelial cells can have very different shapes. They can be squamous, like a pancake, but still strongly connect to the, the ones on the side. They can be cuboidal, as said before. They can be very long and columnar. Uh, and, and they can have these other types of shapes. Some uh, can be a scutoid or uh, trapezoid and uh, well, you can see from this picture that there are different shapes. Well, when you go to uh, mesenchymal cells, there is also a very, uh, very, very different types of cell shapes. Here is a, a so all the pictures on the top is from the same uh, embryo, from the same tissue. It's all mesenchymal cells in the chicken link, but mesenchyme and they can have this very different shape they can be very uh can be have all these protrusions filipodia uh, they can be uh like just polarized one direction polarizing both directions or polarizing many different directions and here on the bottom you see fibroplasts neurocrest cells okay very different sh shapes and then if you look at this and look what you had before many, many different cell shapes. And the question is, okay, if you have a specific cell in mind that you like to model a cell, the question is, how can I tune my parameters to make the cells more, look more like this or more like this? I already tell that it's very hard to make those cells to look like this in a cell. You will need a lot of pixels. You will probably need to actually to break your cells in small compartments, but you can, there are things that can be done. And the idea of this module is to show all the parameters or the basic parameters in CompCell that can actually have an influence in the shape of the cells. So in the last module, we already see that there are different ways to, uh, to model cell behaviors and cell shapes. Uh, this is a simulation where the behavior of the cells were more or less the same. They are fragmented and spread around, but the shapes of the cell were drastically different from one to the other, right? So that simulation can also be a motivation, okay, what are the parameters in couple cell that actually influence cell shapes, okay? So now let's go to our step-by-step -step exercises. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is the same as before. We want to set up a basic simulation where that we use to do our exercises so again please go to tweet it and click on the menu console 3d project and then select new comp cell 3d project okay okay so once you get there uh you open up the wizard Okay, so when you say wizard, what you means by this uh, sets of screens at the beginning when you set them up a new comp cell simulation. And then please give the name of your simulation. So here I gave module one underscore four underscore cell shape. Again, please no spaces, no dots, no slashes or question marks or exclamation marks in your name, just letters numbers uh, and underscores if you wish okay so give the name of simulation python plus xml uh, here in this uh, simulation wizard you can leave everything as it is okay and just hit continue now it comes to the part where you have to actually give a name for yourself You'll be doing a simulation with just one cell. And again, you have to give a name. That's one of the parts that I do not like. Uh, but here I just gave a name of tests, test cell. Okay, so with the cell, we will be testing all the parameters on it. So again, remember, you have to type the name of the cell and then hit add. And make sure that the name of our cell, whatever it is, appears here on the table before you hit continue, okay? So give yourself a name, whatever you may want. You can just use test cell as I give here. 
and hit continue and now this will lead to our another window called chemical fields ignore it and just hit continue okay we're not doing chemical fields today and now we go to the very important uh, window which is the cell properties and behaviors and now you want to ex select many things so i want you to select contact volume flex surface flex and length constraint okay make sure you have those four things selected uh, it does not hurt to have cell center of mass also selected but you absolutely need the contact volume surface and length make sure you have all those four selected and then you hit continue okay. everybody's on board okay so let's continue and then uh Congratulations, the configuration is complete. Once you hit achieve here, hit done, and then we we can be ready to start exploring the simulation. Okay, so hit done, and again, let's not look at the code at the beginning. Let's just open the the simulation, the player, and see what what we get. The player crashes when I want to run this model. Okay. Uh, if someone in the team could help uh, Farnoosh with her uh, model, I will appreciate. Okay. Is this crashing for everyone? Or it's running okay for you, for the rest? okay it's running for most of you so for those of you that did not work please uh, raise your hand and someone from the team will uh, get in contact with you and probably go to a breakout room and uh, check what went wrong okay the issue so if you want simulation what you get is something that exactly looks exactly equal to what you had before right uh, it just creates a group of cells that rounds up okay no surprising because you actually did not configure it, did any configuration in the in the in simulation what you want to do is actually now go to the xml and change the simulation to have only one cell at the beginning okay so yeah but you like to simulate single cell right so how to go back to the edit? I go back to the edit by so on the comp cell player there is an icon which looks like a, a piece of paper with a pencil. You click there and go back to tweet it. Okay. Ah your cells are a little bit elongated, yes, 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 that's true. Okay. Anyway, the simulation right now does not do what you want. Let's Go now to the code, to the XML, and actually configure the, the thing to do what you want. So, oops. So now let's go back to Tweetit and the code, and right-click here on the name of our uh, Compcell simulation module one number underscore four underscore cell shape Compcell three D to open up this and select XML or click here on the xml to actually see the xml code okay 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 yeah the cells look are doing lots of different things because all the plugins we selected they started on okay and we do not want to explore them all at once you want to explore them one at a time right and you also want to explore that in one cell instead of many cells at the same time okay so if you want to go to the breakout room for help, please send a message and someone will assist you. Okay. So let's go to the XML code. Do this part here. 
click on XML to actually open it. And now the first thing that I would like you to do is actually to change the dimensions of your system. Okay, so under the pot section, okay, which should be around line 14, it actually should be exact line 14. Uh, uh, that's where you have the, uh, the dimensions of your system is set up. I want to change the X and the Y from 256 to 100. Okay, so please make sure you have your parameters just like as I have on my screen. X equals 100, Y equals 100. Everybody is following. If so, now let's do change the initial condition of the cells. So let's go out to the end to the XML code where we have uniform initializer. Okay. And instead of having a bunch of cells, I want to just draw one cell. So the way that the box initializer works is that you set a uh, uh, two points, a box minimum and box maximum, and from those two points, the composer draws a square and fills this square with cells of a given width, okay? So right now, it has from 51, 51 on X and Y, to 204 and 204 on the X and Y, and it's filling with cells of type, your name of your cell, and those cells are seven by seven pixels in uh, width, okay? So X and Y are the same. What I want you to do is to instead change those values and make your X and Y start at 40 on line 61 and make your X and Y end at 60 on line 62, okay? So now you're drawing a 20 by 20 box, okay? Right in the middle of the simulation. And okay, so change those two lines 40 40 on the top, 66 on the bottom. Uh, but you do not want to fill this box with seven by seven cells. What you want to do is to fill this box with a single cell. So, to do that, you just specify your cell to be exactly equal to the width and height of the box. So, make width equals 20. And now you are drawing a 20 by 20 region where you instruct comp cell to add a 20 by 20 cell. So your simulation now you have just one cell of 20 by 20. Okay, does this make sense? So there on the slide are all the previous steps in, in case you got behind. But now I'm gonna step on the next slide uh, how to make comments in xml file oh you can look here on line 59 okay this is a way to make comments you make a this sign here and an exclamation mark two slashes and then you can make a, add a comment to it Thank you, Sluka, your comment there. Yeah. That's a good practice to make to com make comments on your code. One thing to be aware of though with XML is that if you comment a comment, mm -hmm. it will crash. You can't put a comment inside of a comment. Good reminder. Yes. Thank you, James. Okay, so assume that everybody is on board. Uh, saved simulation, remember? And uh, let's save simulation. You can go to the menu and save. Directly hit the saving icon and, or hit the shortcuts, Control S if you're on Windows or common S if you're on a Mac. You can tell that I'm on a Mac here, right? So save simulation and I'll play it. 
and tell me what you get. Okay. Save, play, and do you get what you expect or not? Okay. So, so when you play the simulation, uh, oops. You should see a uh, initially square cell of 20 by 20 exactly what you wanted okay but it quickly reduces its size and looks very funny in the end it looks very rough okay and very uh kind of elongated right so why does this happen okay i already have the answer there uh, Yeah, it started getting smaller, right? Why is it getting smaller if I sit, set myself to be 20 by 20? Because, yes, the target volume has not been changed, right? So you forgot to do this. So it doesn't matter what the initial condition of our cell is. If its target volume is different than it is, it's going to go towards that target volume, okay? And it does it very quickly, as you can tell. Now, why does the cell look kind of elongated? It's not look does not look round. Why it looks elongated? Because the length constraint is there. Okay, we did not turn it off. It also looks very rough, right? It seems that it have more surface than it needs. Okay. Uh, again. We set the wizard to add a surface constraint and we didn't do anything, we just leave it there. So it still has a, link, a surface constraint happening. So there are too many constraints working on the cell right now, okay? So we cannot study all of them simultaneously. What you want to do now is to just turn all of them off and leave only the volume plugin to, to begin with, okay? So that's exactly what you do. So, yeah. So in the current simulation, we have four plugins turned on at the same time. Um, the cell is over constrained and it's there because we just tell the wizard to be there. Okay. So let's, uh, all these plugins work in a very similar way, except for the contact energy. The volume, surface, and length plugins, they have this shape which is look like a spring, as we talked before. Okay, so volume, surface, and length string, they have this format where is whatever property value that you have minus its target volume. This difference is squared, okay, times some kind of uh, strength or lambda value or the strength that says how strong this constraint is on our cells. If this value is low, it's okay to deviate from this target value. If it's very high, you restrict, you want to be very close to this target value. All right? Okay, so, so this is exactly the, uh, the format of the volume, surface, and length per string, they all look exactly similar, is a strength of the constraint, the current value of that property, and the target value that you wish those, this cell to have, all right? And then this is how, when it's on the target value, the energy term is zero, when it deviates from the target value, either higher or lower, it you get increase in energy and that is penalized in the way that comp cell works good question what does volume mean in 2d it's just the surf the okay in 2d you don't have really have a volume what you have is a surf an area and a perimeter right so in a 2d simulations the volume of the cell is the number of pixels or it's surface or this area as you see from the top and its surface is actually the 
perimeter of the cell, as you see from the top. Okay. When you go to the 3D simulations, now the volume is the number of pixels or voxels. Voxel is a pixel in three dimensions, right? And that is the actual volume. And the surface actually the number of uh, is actually a surface the how the boundary surface of that uh, involves your set of voxels that make up your cell. So in a 2D simulation, surface means periphery and volume means area. Okay. So that's a, a very good distinction. So we'll be only doing 2D simulations today. Could someone uh, share the link for the live video on YouTube? Okay, thank you. All right, so let's continue. So, so before we can do anything useful, let's turn off all the plugins that we will not be using at the moment. So please go to tweet it, double click on module one under score four underscore cell shape on our Compcell 3D project on the left panel. So you can expand uh, the contents of your of your code and let's click on the xml to actually see the xml uh, code in front of you okay. once you get there let's first turn off the surface plugin so remember the surface plugin has this uh, shape here uh, and this is the place in the xml code where it specifies the surface plugin and is listed by cell types is only have one cell type simulation and here are the two parameters the strength of the constraint and the target value of the surface in this case so we want to turn it off and the way to turn it off is just making this zero when you make this zero it does not matter what's happening to the cell surface it does not contribute to the energy of the system so that's the same thing as turning off the plugin Okay, and now, so this with this, we turn off the search plugin. And the next thing I would like to turn off will be the length constraint plugin. Okay, so you do the same thing. You'll be in a different line of the code, it should be around line 48. Okay, and if you go below, again, cell type, strength of constraint, and the target property of your constraint. So. Let's set the lambda length equals to zero and the target length you can leave that number. It doesn't matter. Once you set this to zero, this can be whatever you want. Is the is not gonna be read by the code. Actually it's read by the code, but does not contribute to the dynamics of the cell. Okay. So are you all with me? Yes, thank you for answering. Uh, so now let's save this code now with the two plugins turned off and play the simulation. So remember, we have to hit this button or go file save to save it. And to play the simulation, you have to either uh, right click or double click on the name of the module, hit opening player, or just hit this. And you should now see a simulation that looks very different than what you had before, right? So now you should see that the cell that, oops, it still decreases its size, right? But it has a different shape now. Do you all get something similar to this? Yes or no? So we fix two things, but you forgot to fix the the target, uh, the, the volume of the cell, right? Uh, we took out the length constraint and the uh, surface constraint, so you now you see that the cell looks very different what, from what you had before. Before it was kind of elongated and very rough. Now it looks a little bit more round, okay? But because you'll be doing a whole module on the cell shapes, 
I don't want to do all the exercises on a very small cell. I want to do the exercise on a very big cell. So you can appreciate the effects better. Okay. Uh, your cells do not decrease in size. Maybe we'll fix it. Okay. Uh, so what okay, so what you should do in the code? We want to turn off the surface of the cell, the lamp the the surface plugin, and I want you all to turn off the length plugin. Okay, so we turn off the two plugins, but we did not uh, touch the length constraint. So uh, the cell is still starts in a big square 20 by 20 but it still decreases and happens super fast if you could not see it stop simulation and instead of hitting the play button you hit the button next to it which is the one with the a circle inside and then you can step the play simulation step by step and then you can see those intermediate states okay so let's fix this let's make the cell to be to want to have that 20 by 20 volume okay so to do this well uh, well the reduction volume is still happening because we did not touch there's a discrepancy between the what you set the initial cell to be right that 20 by 20 uh, set of pixels but the target volume is still set to be 50 which is the default value that the wizard gives you at the beginning of the simulation. So what you want to do now is actually make this target volume to be equal to 20 by 20. Okay. Actually, what you want to do is now will be our, this will be our first exercises exercise. What happens if we change the target volume of the cell? Okay. Ah, you have several cells set one because you probably did not change the uniform initializer. So look at your code are around line 57. Make sure that you, your box coordinates, which you use to draw your cells, is 40, 40, 60, 60. And make sure that the width of the cell that you're going to draw inside this box is 20. Yeah, so make sure you have those values here in our XML code. Okay. So if you're already uh, there, please try now to do some simulation with higher and lower values of the target volume. Okay. So yeah, so that's basically what I want to do, which is the result of 20 by 20, right? Uh, Okay, good question. What's the difference between length constraint and surface constraint? We will get there in a minute, okay? Or in 20, 25 minutes. But we'll talk about it. Okay. So now, if you change your target uh, volume to 400, the cell now keeps its volume. Of course, it does kind of change its shape Initially, it was a square, now it's round. This is happening uh, because you not only have the volume plugin turned on, but you also have the content plugin turned on. So there is some kind of cost of, for the cell to have surface with the medium, okay? So the cell, a square is not very good, so it wants to, to round, okay? So one of the exercises, the first exercise I want you to do in this module, we, okay, now let's play with this target volume, make it bigger or smaller, and let's see what happens. Okay, so please start to do this now. And try higher values and lower values. And let me see how it goes. Okay, you right hit something that you will talk about. For this one, it's very nice to do that actually on the player. 
you can change the value of the target volume direct on the player and you can see the cell growing and shrinking growing and shrinking okay So while you do this exercise, I will try to upload this set of slides to the uh, student materials right now, so you can actually uh, go back and catch the, the uh, catch up with, with the rest of the class. Okay, so when you play with the target volume, you can you what you expect to see is, is exactly like this. If you make the target volume smaller, you get a smaller cell. If you make the target volume bigger, you get a bigger cell. Not much surprise. You can also try to set the target volume to zero. And what you get is exactly what your colleague said. If made to zero, the cell disappeared. And that's an efficient way to uh, to to kill the cells in your simulation. So let's say the a cell simulation should die because of so and so and so. You can set the target volume of the cell to zero and the cell sh will shrink and disappear. Okay. Uh, yes, I did switch the surface plugin by making lambda the surface equals to zero. Okay. By the way, uh, for the person that crashed the course and was behind, I just uploaded the two PowerPoint slides to the student material folder in the Google Drive. You should be able to go there, download and open it. Okay. Yeah, the volume change fast. It's not uh, instantaneously, but it, go, it, can, it can get bigger and smaller very fast. But that happens in this simulation where you don't have other cells to compete with, right? Once you have a cell embedded surrounded with other cells, the change in volume can take a little bit longer. Okay. So the current parameters, okay, we turn off the uh, surface and length constraint plugins. Uh, and we are just now exploring the effects of the vo target volume. So we're basically doing uh, go on we are exploring the, those parameters on line 27 to 29 in the XML code okay so if you if you got lost a little bit in track these slides have been uploaded you can uh, download and see them by yourself uh, the code So good uh, reminder by James, you want to kill cell without not only set the target volume to zero, but you also want to make the lambda volume very high, so the cell really wants to shrink and disappear. So just setting the target volume to be is not guaranteed that it will uh, disappear. You may also have noticed as you are playing with this, that when you set a target volume lower than 30, uh, the cells also disappear. Okay, if you set uh, for 20 or 10, they also disappear. There is a reason for that. We'll talk about that later in this module. Okay, there is a good reason for that. You understand that, but 
let, let us get there. You go, you got you get there in an instant. Okay. So. So the for the remaining of the the module now, I want you to set the volume to a thousand. Okay, so I want to, you guys to have a very big cell, okay? And let's now explore the effects of the lambda constraint, okay? So let's make the target volume equals to 1,000 pixels. And let's, uh, well, we can start by setting the lambda volume to 2 and see what happens. So when you set a thousand, the cell grows a little bit, but it stays like that. And you can see that the cell uh, is not frozen, right? It has this uh, bigger shape, but uh, the pixels around the cell are fluctuating, right? You, the cell is still able to move. You have some membrane ruffling of the cell. So the cell looks healthy you know, in a way. Now, Okay, now you have the simulation running. Let's try to make your lambda volume from 2 to 50 or even higher values. And tell me what you expect to happen if you make the target volume, the, the strength of volume higher and why it would happen. Please, before doing simulation, tell me on the chat what will happen if you make your lambda volume to be higher. You can also unmute yourself and tell me what you have what you happen. The two answers are correct. Less fluctuation, converge ta to target faster. Yes. Oh, less variation, okay. Okay. Good guesses. Let's try the simulation, see what you get. Okay, so this is what happened on my end, okay? Yes, the cell does grow faster, okay? It was 20 by 20, now it wants to be higher, okay? Uh, but you see that after this very fast increase, the shape fluctuates much slower than before. So this is a simulation of target volume equals 50, and I took this screenshot uh, still at the beginning of simulation, we did not have time to round up. So you see that it does not look, the cell it looks a little bit fro uh, less dynamic than you, than you had before, right? And the reason that this happens is written here on the slide, is that once the cell achieves its target volume, right, is already happy. And it does not want to accept other spin flips, or oh, sorry, pixel copy, copies that you change the, the volume. So once the cell went from this square of 400 pixels to this shape that actually matches a thousand pixels, it needs a little bit more spin, uh, pixel copies to round it, okay? But the problem is that all those pixel copies that are left to round the cell will be penalized because they mean that you'll be deviating, momentarily deviating your current cell volume to a higher or lower volume to achieve that rounding. And when you set this lambda volume to uh, a number that's too high, this will be penalized. So you're going to slow the cell. You're going to be, you'll be kind of freezing the cell when you do this. Okay. So if you set your lambda volume to 50, the cell can still round, but it's going to take a little bit longer. Does this make sense? Yeah, so the cell grows faster towards its target shape, but once it gets there, it's harder for it to evolve its shape. Okay. 
exactly that. Is actually that's exactly like that. It is a deeper well, energy well. Okay, so it is harder to fluctuate your energy around. Okay, if this makes sense, let's proceed. Okay, if you have not, uh, there should not be this knot there. Try to make lambda volume equals to 100 and see what happens. What do you expect to happen if you make it the lambda volume equals to 100 or even higher? You can try a thousand and tell me what the result is. No, keep the target volume to be a, a thousand. But now let's make the lambda volume to be hundred or two hundred or five hundred. Janus got a more rigid cell. Actually, ah, maybe you not get rounded at all. Okay. Yeah, the cell becomes static, right? Because yeah, exactly, it denies most pit copy attempts. Okay, it, it it grows a little bit at the beginning, right? Right. So if you stop simulation and play it again using the step by the step function. One Monte Carlo step at a time, you see that it grows, and once it reaches its target volume, it's gonna stay there and not change. Okay, so setting the target volume of sorry, the lambda volume to be a super high number is a very effective way of freezing the cell in your simulation. Sometimes you want to have some cells in your simulation that do not move, that do not change shape, they are more like the part of the environment of your simulation than the, what you're actually simulating. You can enforce that by either right at the beginning of the wizard telling the wizard to freeze those cells. There is an option freeze, that's what it means. But if you want to do that in the middle of simulation, you can also do that by just making your tag lambda volume to be a very high number. You make it a thousand, uh, a million, and that will freeze your cell. Okay, so okay, why this is happening? Because again, uh, once you have, if you make your lambda volume very high, you're basically penalizing all the pixel copy attempts that you that you deviate the cell from its current target uh, volume. Okay. Okay, so a hundred effectively freeze the cell in these current simulations. But you may be surprised that in an odd simulation that you do further along, you set your lambda volume to a hundred and the cells still move. Okay? Then you may wonder what happened. Well, again, what matters is not the absolute number of the target of the uh, constraint strain, is its vol is uh, but its value compared to the other parameter values and also to the temperature of your system. Okay, if you set your temperature of the system to be at a thousand, having a lambda volume of a hundred will not freeze your cell. Okay, so here a thousand is already enough to freeze your cell because the temperature, the default temperature in the comp cell simulations when you start them with the wizard is 10, and a hundred is very bigger compared to 10. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay. You have always to see how the how this plugin parameters of this plugin uh, are with respect to the other settings of your simulation. Okay. Oops. So let's try to do this. Let's put this on the test. To the test. In the current simulation, the temperature has a default value of t equals ten. Okay. You can check this by looking at tweeted and look at the pot section of the XML file, and it's right there then. 
So let's put this to the test. Let's see if the instructor here is telling uh, you the truth. So let's keep the or lambda volume to, to 100 and set the temperature to 100 too. Okay. So you might expect the results to be similar to simulation with 10 and 10. And now I want you to tell me, does this actually happen or not? Okay. So please try to do this and tell me, should you get the same results? Yes, no, or, or maybe better. Try the simulation, tell me if you got what you expect or not. Remember, temperature here does not mean temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit or Kelvins. Temperature here is more of an inherited term that actually means the amount of noise in your simulation. Okay, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. The cell is not frozen anymore. Yes. But do you get exactly what you had before uh, with 10 J, with lambda 10 and T equals 10? Or do you get something that looks different? It's not frozen, but it's not the same. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not frozen and it's fluctuating with a higher pace. Okay. Uh, it's continuously fluctuating. Uh, before that, it was frozen. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. So, so what's happened? You should not, you, you expect the same result, but it didn't actually happen. What are we missing in your logic here? Very good, Stephen. So read what Stephen said. This is because the temperature is also affecting the contact energy. Okay, so so this is what happened. Uh, this is what you had before, a cell that grows very quick but becomes freezing. Then increase the temperature and now the cell, okay, it fluctuates, it's not frozen anymore, but it was very rough. And the reason why it was still rough is because you know it not only have volume and temperature in your simulation the simulation also have the contact energy remember we did not turn that off so so what happens when you make the volume lambda volume equals 100 and the temperature equals 100 and you do not touch the the contact energies is that you decrease the relative contribution of the contact energies to the evolution or to the dynamics of your simulation. So making those two parameters, lambda volume and temperature high, is the same thing as keeping them as they were before and decreasing the uh, contact energy of the addition between the cell and the medium. Does this make sense? Now, because the relative contribution of contact energy is lower, the cell does not care much about the its surface area with the medium and becomes rougher. So setting both the volume constraint to be high and the temperature to be high is the same thing as telling the cell I don't care more about the contact anymore. And so that's the same thing as turning off the contact energy. Does this make sense? What happened in simulation? So, yes. Okay. So let's now uh, put this to the test again. Let's redo the simulation with lambda volume equals 100, t equals 100, and now let's make your j between medium and our cell to also be 100. So, so let's let's try to recover behavior by changing j medium j test. So please do that and let me know, see if it, now it works.
yes there is a find function in Twidit Okay, so this is so this is what I ask you to do, okay? And so this is what you have before. Oh, sorry, it's wrong here. This should be a ten, right on the first panel. Oh no, that, no, that's what we did. So we first. So I got lost in my own slide. Uh, so it turns out that a set of values of 100, 100, and 100, so the three parameters that we have in our simulation, is equivalent of the same set of values to be 10, 10, and 10. Okay, so if you all raise those three parameters by the same factor, the simulate those two simulations here and here should be exactly the same. Okay, so here you have the simulation where you just increase the lambda volume. The cell grow and frozen freezes. On the second panel, we try to compensate by just increase the temperature. The cell is no longer frozen, but is very rough. But then we also increase the contact energy between medium and cell, and now all of them are about the same level. And now the cell rounds and actually change this shape. Okay. So, is this making sense? Okay, uh, James Luca has a very good uh, point here. In most computer reruns, you don't want the energy minimum of the system. You want a trajectory in space and time. Okay, so, because biology never operates at the global energy minima. Because that's that. So I know that this may seem a little bit boring, okay? Because we are not doing the crit, we are not doing the angiogenesis, we are not doing the cancer simulation, we are not doing anything that seems to be publishable, right? But these are the very basics of the compass of simulation, the cellular pots modeling, okay? And if you have a good foundation here, uh, I think it should be uh, uh, much easier to follow later. You're gonna really master the new tools that we're giving you uh, in the rest of the week okay so is there any questions at this point or can we proceed excuse me can we assign different value of temperatures for different cell types or cells yes yes you can there is a way to do it um now i forgot the exact way but there is a way to do it and you do that from the you can do that from the python code i think you can also do that from the xml code it's not something that i usually that i use myself but there is a way to do this a temperature for each cell type i mean dynamically for example in this type of all that whenever we code in some specific circumstance we change the temperature according to the you know the situation Yes, there is a way to ch all the parameters that you see on the XML code, you can access them from the Python level and change them during the course simulation. Okay, it can even be, be, be made a function of other things. So there is a way to change any of the parameters in the XML code from the Python level and during the course simulation. Okay. We will talk about that uh, as you go as we advance the course. But yes, there is a way to do it. Oh, great, because I have the same question for the contact energy. For example, we assign a specific value. I was thinking that how we can change it. Previously, I used like contact adhesion flex in order, I mean, define some molecules, then change the densities of those molecules in order to have different mm -hmm. uh, adhesion energy. So I was wondering if uh, we can have contact energy directly 
with this plugin, uh, we, we can have it. So No, the answer is no. If you want to change cell by cell, you have to use the molecular species specification. You mean the um, adhesion flex plugin? That's right. Okay, so with this uh, contact plugin, it's not possible, right? No, contact plugin only allows you to define uh, energies by cell type, not by individual cell. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the contact plugins by cell type. As can, I, can I just add something? Yes. Uh, we will show you how to change, how to set specific energy, uh, contact energy values for uh, different different cells of the same type, okay? So you can, uh, let's say, clusterize your cells, uh, group them in clusters and say, oh, uh, this cluster uh, behave differently from this other cluster. And they are uh, the same cell type. You, you can do this, and we will show you how to do this in day, day three, okay? Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's continue. And now there's, let's explore another perm, uh, plugin that affects the shape of the cells okay so and one of these other ones is the contact energy okay so let's explore how the contact energy affects the cells okay so uh so before we explore the contact energy let's uh reset all the parameters of simulations back to the default values which is temperature equals 10 target volume equals to a thousand lambda volume to be 10 and the j between medium and test cell to be 10 okay so let's please let's do do this and once you set up all those uh, parameters back to the original values let's now play with the division between the me the cell and the medium okay which is the only addition energy that's that plays a role in the simulation. And now I want you to make those values even either higher, first make them higher, and tell me what you expect to happen and why, okay? So, so tell me already in the chat before you do any simulation, what you expect if you increase the J medium, the, the J between medium and the cell to a value higher than that. More solid, okay, why? Feel free to the surface, okay. Someone said the cell should shrink. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Okay, so let's do, do the simulation. Tell me if this happens. Okay, so if you do the simulation, you may notice that as you increase the the addition value between the cell and the and the in the medium, the memory fluctuations uh, decrease, the cell becomes rounder, and the bigger you make, the rounder it, it becomes, and the less you know, also reduce the movement and the cell shape change in the cell. So you all I guess right what will happen? It will round and it become more rigid. Okay. 
So this happens again because of the strong ionization of the contact surface between the cell and the medium. And once you have this value too high and you already is happy with this current settings, if you uh, uh, you will not accept any other uh, pixel copy that deviates from its current value. So here in the simulation, you have a, a contact surface and a volume constraint. And because we want to minimize both the, uh, vo uh, the surface with keeping the volume the same, the resulting shape for your cell should be uh, a circle or something that's very close to a circle. Okay. So once you get the circle with your desire uh, that uh, satisfy your uh, volume, target volume, you the cell tends to not change its shape anymore. And the higher you make this J, the, the more strong is this effect. So now let's do the, uh, the, the other way around. Let's decrease the addition value between cell and the medium to lower values. Tell me what you expect to happen and why. Roundish rough surface. Okay. What if you keep decreasing it even more? <laughs> Blabbing. <laughs> okay. So this is more or less what should happen. Okay. Uh, before you have 50, a very high value, it becomes very round. Now you start to decreasing, and the more you decrease, the less it cares about its current shape, uh, uh, boundary outline, and start to become very rough. And if you actually make those J value equals to zero, that's equivalent of completely turning off the effects of constant uh, energy, uh, contact energy of the cell. The cell doesn't see the mid anymore. It doesn't see itself anymore. And when you make those J between medium and cell to be zero, you actually uh, turn off that plugin and you just fragment the cell and the cell break into pieces, it becomes dust. Okay. So the lower the value of the J, the more easily it accepts uh, deviations from its surface that it actually increase the surface of the cell with the medium. But if you decrease too much, you can actually lead to the fragmentation of the cell itself. Just like on the module before, you are decreasing the energy of the cells in the medium and that you favor the cells to actually go to the medium and you fragment the tissue. Here you have the equivalent uh, analogous situation where you actually fragment the cell itself. Okay. Does this make sense? Okay. So. So okay, but that's it's not the whole story about contact energy. There is another parameter that also plays a role in it. Okay. And this parameter is called the neighboring order. Okay. So remember that what we talk about contact energy before is that the way it works is every time you have a spin flick tool, the, the, the energy works by looking at all, looking at that spin that has been flipped and looking all around its uh, surface uh, or its neighborhood and then calculating all those J values between that pixel and all the pixels around, okay? But the question is, okay, how you define this neighborhood at which you look around each one of those house pixels okay so so in this case you have the cell here and you're flipping this pixel here 
and then you're looking at all those other pixels around it and calculate the J between this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this and so on, okay? Actually, these ones here do not calculate because they belong to the same cell. So you define them to be have a zero contribution, but you calculate these other ones. And then how you determine how far you go this? Should you go all to this or only to this four here? So there's a parameter in your contact energy plugin, which is called the neighbor order. Okay. So, oops. So there's a neighbor order which basically sets how far you look around. So the neighbor order is defined as following: is the set of sequence uh, around the uh, sequence of pixel sets around the center pixel. So neighbor order one means this first four pixels here uh, in a two-dimensional square lattice, of course. In a three-dimensional, it's going to be different. In an hexagonal lattice, will be different as well. So the first neighbor order is just these four ones. Second neighbor order, you include those corners. Third neighbor order, you include these ones. Fourth neighbor order, you include these. And the total number of pixels which you actually use to calculate your contact energy term keeps increasing as you keep having higher and higher neighboring orders okay so that's something uh, so again for a neighbor order equals four you look at this very first 20 pixels around that pixel that's being flipped at the moment does it make sense so Excuse me, does increasing the neighbor order uh, increase the computational cost? Yes, a little bit, because you have to calculate more pairs. Okay. Yes, it does. So, if you don't extend this much more in theory, let's maybe try to do this in practice to see if this, uh, how this works. So... Yes, increasing the pixel order does make it, have, yes, the, the seller pots model comes from the pots model, it comes from the IZ model, so, and this energy term is a direct inheritance of, uh, of, of, the, of the IZ model, okay? So let's see how this works in practice. No, sorry, there was this other question. Does increase the neighbor order make it long range interaction? Yes, when, as you increase the neighboring order that you're using for the contact energy, uh, you also have the, oops, the fact that a cell that, if there's another cell that is here, you start to see some effect of the other cell as you get near the cell. Okay. So increase the neighboring order, allow two cells that are not really touching to right start interacting. Okay, so there is this effect. But in the simulator that you are using, you only have one cell, okay, and a medium, so you are only seeing the effect of the on the cell shape. Okay, as we explore this parameter, you see where you may uh, what one of the possible meanings of this parameter. Okay, so let's uh, set up a simulation to explore this. Let's make our Parameters equal to the basic parameters, temperature equals 10, target volume equals 1000, lambda volume 10, and let's keep the J of the cell and medium equals to 10 as well. And now let's try to directly change this parameter called neighbor order. Okay. So here, if you go to the contact plugin in the code, which should be lines 40 to 46, okay. There is this line here called neighbor order, which is currently at four. Let's make this, let, let's try to make the simulation with higher and lower numbers of neighboring order and see what happens, okay? So as you do this exercise, please pay attention that there are two neighbor orders in the, uh, in our comp cell codes, one that appears in the contact plugin but there's another one that appears in the pots. We are only dealing with the second one, okay? 
you are only dealing with the neighbor order that appears under contact. Okay. Okay, so please uh, go there and do a simulation with a higher and a lower neighboring order and tell me what you what do you see. So what did you guys got? So many say that when you they use lower numbers, the cell look rougher. And when you use a higher number, what happened? It becomes roundish, okay. So that's exactly what should happen. Lower number, orders it looks more rough okay and higher looks more round okay and so that's you can me notice that this that's something that already james said this is kind of equivalent of increasing and decreasing the uh additional energy okay so remember if you make the additional energy lower it becomes rougher that's kind of similar to this and you make the additional energy higher it becomes like rounder which is like uh, increasing the neighboring order and that makes a little bit sense because the higher the neighborhood that you use the more pixel pairs you are comparing and summing up so having a higher neighboring order you are effectively adding making uh, your addition energy to have a higher weight in your simulation and when you make it shorter, you're, you're at most calculating four pairs, right? So it's less J's that you're summing up in the calculation of your energy term. So that's why when you, if you suddenly want to increase your neighborhood from four to five or four to seven, uh, you may s suddenly see that the cells change shape a lot because you're in effectively increasing the, the weight of the additional energy on your simulation and as I say this you may think that okay those two things are equivalent but they are not okay increase the J or decreasing the J is not equivalent as decreasing the, J, the, the neighbor order or increase the neighboring order okay they have different and important effects you can write tell to see if you compare this simulation here if neighbor order equals one and this one if j equals one you see that they are not quite the same okay they look different okay let me explain what is this uh what, what's different okay so what's happening is that okay the neighbor order and the contact energies are not uh the same okay they, they, they have similar effects but they're very different from each other okay to highlight those difference, let's do a set simulation where we compensate this change from the other. Okay, so we can use this table here, and let's do the following. If we keep the neighbor order equals four, okay, and j equals 10, ten as a reference, let's make the simulation with n neighbor order equals one. So when you do that simulation with neighbor order equals one, you are only calculating four pixel pairs. Okay. So what you can do to compensate is actually increase that addition value by a factor of 10 times 20 by 4. Okay, so you are decreasing from 
20 pix pairs of pixels to four pack pairs of pixels so by a factor of five so let's increase the j by also a factor of five to compensate we can also do this the, the other way let's make a neighbor order of seven a neighbor of seven has 36 cell pairs so let's decrease your j by a factor of 20 by 36 5.26 so in terms of how much energy you calculate for each spin flexible when you do these adjustments you're calculating the exact same energy okay so if the neighbor order and the digital energy were the same you expect to see the same cell output but you do not do see the same cell output you see different okay so please try to do those two simulations and compare to what you had before and tell me what those differences are The J medium is not being used in the simulation because you only have one medium. So that parameter there has zero contribution on that simulation and actually usually has zero contribution on our simulations. So there is no simulation that actually uses more than one background. Yeah, it didn't have any impact. Okay, so have you tried simulation? Okay. So what happens if for n equals one and a higher j? Can anyone, anyone tell me? Okay, we are already over time, so we're gonna just jump to the next slide. So you should guess simulation that looks like this. Okay. So when you use a lower neighboring order, but you and you try to compensate by having an increased J, what happens is that you get a very squarish cell. Okay. Uh, so why this happens? This happens because uh, in our simulations the weight of the contact energy is exactly the same from one to another but when you look at neighboring order equals one you are only uh, minimizing the surface in the very first four pixels okay so so the each pixel only see the curvature of its own pixel okay so it in other words it doesn't see a curvature at all so what's happening is this the the cell shape tends to align itself with the pixels of the lattice and effect which is called lattice spinning in this type of simulations okay so so that's bad you can compensate that by actually using a very high number of uh, neighboring order so when you look at high number of order and you compensate by decreasing the the j's okay the cells looks more round okay 
So, and then it, it, the cells tend to be smoother, okay? So it tends to be a little bit rounded, it's a better rounding, rounded shape. Uh, maybe that exactly snapshot that I took was not very uh, good, but that's the effect it has. So usually the, uh, is you're basically averaging, uh, looking at a higher value here, and here you're looking just right here, so here, oops, oops, you are no only look at a very emitted neighborhood, so you don't really smooth the cell, but here you're looking at a higher neighborhood, so you smooth the cell. Okay, so so usually it's bad to use higher uh, neighboring orders, but the higher neighborhood you use, you have these two effects. First, you slow down your simulation because you're doing more uh, computation per pixel flip. And the other thing is that you start to get interaction of cells with other cells that are not really touching each other. Okay, so that may be an undesirable effect of this. So you want to use, usually use as a lower neighboring order that you can get away with. And in 2D simulations, in a square lattice, a neighboring order 4 is usually the best one to use and from my experience when you go to 3D simulations a neighboring order of 5 is the best you can use okay uh, yes uh, the if the square shape at the beginning is more related to the initial condition yes it can be but you also have this strong uh, alignment of the peaks of the boundaries with the lattice, uh, with the lattice, okay? And that's usually an undesirable effect. Okay. So let me see, okay, now what I would have continued this by exploring the effects of the surface energy, but we are already 15 minutes over time. So I will stop here uh, with only this uh, thing. So these are really the core of your simulations. In all your simulations, you have the volume constraint. You always, in all your simulations, you have the energy constraint, okay? And in all simulations, you have you are varying this parameter in respect to temperature. So this basically covers all the basics. Okay, maybe I can t tell you about we can discuss about the surface plugin and the length plus plugin, uh, or you can try by yourself. You, the slides will be are made available on the Google folder, and um, you can try by yourself uh, late tonight or early tomorrow morning. Okay, I'll stop here and uh, again, thank you for your patience and uh, going along. And you can do the other surface constraint and uh, length constraint as homeworks. Okay, you can also, uh, and I'll hand over to the rest of the team now to take over the discussion here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Julio. We have time for a few questions. Any discussion people would like to have, clarification, comments that would be helpful to people? Feel free to unmute and uh, ask away.
Thank you, Julio, for a very clear presentation. These are problems that are not obvious to people if they haven't worked with the system. Uh, and so it's important to, uh, to get a handle on how these work uh, before you get too involved. So I appreciate it very much. Uh, I, uh, have, I have a question. Yes, please. So, uh, so this uh, the sim the simulation that uh, Julio has showed that is basically on single cells. So, if you have confluent cell monolayer without the medium, then that yes. is uh, that is changing the parameter will affect the same way as this as for the single cell as well. Means uh, as they are doing for the single cell. So, is it is it will it become the same for the confluent cell monolayer as well? Yeah. Well, the the answer is mostly. Um, if you have a confluent monolayer of cells, you have cells in touch contact with other cells. And so in that case, instead of the cell medium contact energy, what will matter is the cell cell contact energy uh, and everything else will be similar. One difference is that if you have uh, cells in contact with each other, as, as Julia showed at the very beginning, you'll have threefold junctions where, vertice, where cells have vertices, three cells come together. Uh, and those uh, junctions have slightly different behaviors from a single cell, which has no uh, vertices. And so uh, that will look more like the simulation that uh, Giuliano showed of foams, uh, where you have dynamics because of the behavior of the threefold contacts. Uh, between cells. Uh, you saw the simulation that Julio showed early on of cell, cell sorting, where you had yeah, cells yeah. of two different types that separate. Um, that's the kind of uh, surface energy dynamics that you get when you have cells in contact with each other. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, just to uh, give you a heads up for tomorrow, uh, we're going to talk about applying explicit forces to cells. Uh, that allows you to do various kinds of cell motility simulation. Uh, uh, then uh, we're going to have the uh, hackathon lightning talks, uh, followed by a discussion of the hackathon and uh, some presentation uh, by TJ of the... Uh, COVID models that he's been building with CompuCell. And then in the afternoon, uh, Joshua is going to tell you how to implement chemical fields and diffusion uh, and to understand how those work. So that's the agenda for tomorrow. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I'm looking in the chat. Uh, if you're going to do apical basal polarity, uh, then depending on what kind of system you're working with, uh, you may want to use compartmental cells where the individual cells have different apical basal and basolateral properties. And Julio will show you how to do that uh, later in the course. Any other comments or questions? I know it's getting a little bit late. Uh, these are long days. Uh, they're long days even when we did it in person, but they're longer. Uh, they're longer now that, uh, uh, that we do things uh, uh, by Zoom. I appreciate everyone's patience with any snafus about Zoom or uh, NanoHub uh, implementation. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. In that case, I want to thank you for coming and I look forward to meeting with you tomorrow.